Hi right, guys, uh, welcome. I'm shocked to see how many people are in this room to learn about Python, that's awesome. Um, so this is our inaugural Big Data for Better Business uh, educational series. Uh, my name is Harry Mameski, I'm the director, the faculty director of the program for financial studies. This is Melina Denebein, who is the director of the program for financial studies. Um, we thought that it may be a good idea to offer a series of three hour executive education style courses for the Columbia Business School community um, that will show people how to apply some of the cutting edge tools that are out there to business problems. That was our initial idea. Um, our second talk will be by Professor Oded Netzer. It's going to be on Wednesday, March 27th on using natural language processing or NLP in thinking about marketing and business decisions. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is because the language of this field, maybe the two languages of this field of applying these cool new tools to business problems are R, language with the letter R, and Python. And so we thought that before we bombard people with applying tools to business problems, we should teach people like the basic, what does the tool look like? So when you actually get to see some of the applications, it'll seem a little bit less mysterious. It'll be just, you start Python, you write a bunch of code, it does stuff exactly like you'll be doing here, but you'll see it applied to different domains. Um, if you're interested in natural language processing in finance, I should also plug a conference we have coming up on Wednesday, March 13th, right? Uh, it's called News and Finance. It'll be an all-day event held at the Journalism School here, which will bring together researchers from academia, from uh, industry, as well as some journalists to discuss how news gets made, disseminated, and how financial markets respond to news. Um, so with that, uh, I want to introduce Matan Grupo, who is your instructor. Uh, I was looking up some bio stuff. So Matan has started his own company called One Month, which is like an online coding academy. Uh, he has a list of corporations where he's taught that's far too long to recite in only three hours, but it's very impressive. And he's super at what he does, so I will yield the floor to him. And uh, thank you for awesome. being here. Thank you, Harry. Um, great. This is a small step to get an intro to be my own business. That's actually Columbia's campus but I don't think it's live. Uh, I don't think we have credit lessons right now. Um, this is me. My name is Matan Rafael, as I already mentioned. Um, I love teaching coding to total beginners. That's like my jam. That's what I get off on. And the reason why is, uh, so I'm, I'm a self-taught programmer. I will say that up front. I studied finance for my undergraduate degree. And um, I taught myself coding because I had to, out of necessity. Um, I had a startup idea and I just didn't have enough money to pay someone to build it for me. So like, I had to go online and find resources. And this was back in 2011. There weren't a lot of training boot camps or things like that out there. So I had to be resourceful. Uh, and it was a pretty daunting experience. Like when you're first learning how to code, you don't know anything about what you're reading. Uh, but I found that coding was actually kind of fun. I think the problem with learning how to code is that it's taught so poorly. Hopefully today I'll show you. I mean, I'm assuming most people here have never coded before, right? Like, raise your hand if you've never touched code in your life. Okay, good. That means I'm addressing the right audience. There may be some of you here who have done a little bit of coding and you know, C or dot or R or whatever took a class in high school, and that's fine, but this class is not meant for you. It'll still be interesting, but um, I'm really gonna be addressing people who have never coded before. Because when I was learning how to code, I found that all the resources were like not for that kind of person. You need to read something, and it already assumed you had some knowledge that you didn't have. It's called cursed knowledge, right? That when someone's an expert in something, they've internalized so much that it's very hard for them to explain it to a beginner. So it was going through that process of learning how to code that I enjoyed it so much, and I was like, oh, this would be really useful for business people to know how to do, whether it's because they're just you know, want to do a little bit of data analysis or write a web scrape or build a website. Like simple stuff where you don't actually have to be a coder, but you can use a little bit of code. We'll talk more about what you use it for. Um, so I started doing these online 
started this blog post and then a series of guides and eventually created this company called Vama. Uh, one month, was a, we got accepted to Y Combinator, we did the whole startup uh, venture funding round, raised $3 million, built a team, and I did that for five years. And then three years ago, I started teaching at Columbia Business School. So what started as just an idea of maybe we can do a Python class inside the business school, specifically for MBAs, not you know cross-class with the engineering program, but like really, what do MBAs need to know about coding, uh, has really expanded. And we now have 200 students this semester learning Python, and then another 150 learning SQL, which was the second class that I started teaching a few years ago. Um, that's a little bit about my background, just so you sort of know. It's my favorite thing in the world is to teach this stuff, um, but only the people who have never heard it. <laughs> so, uh, so what do you use Python for? Like, we probably all, we're here for a reason, we've heard about Python, and maybe we've read an article, or, you know, this, it's got good branding right now, right? But it's still kind of unclear to a lot of people, at least it was for me, what do you do with that? So here's a few examples. Uh, you can build websites with Python, you can clean, analyze data, you can do natural language processing. I'll show you a little bit about that later in today's seminar. Um, machine learning, scraping websites, sending emails, but like the list is really endless because fundamentally it's just a way to tell your computer to do something. Um, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, so here's some examples, and I'll show you how to do plotting using Python, plotting data. Um, there's a, this service that I teach in my class called Twilio. It's a publicly traded company it's worth several billion dollars, and you can use the right Python code that sends people text messages or uh, emails them. In fact, when you you know when you use Uber and they send you like a verification code over text, they use Twilio, and it's just code for doing stuff that you know. Previously, humans had to do manually. Uh, or web scraping, for example, you know, doing the same kind of repetitive task over and over again. You can hire someone to do it, or you can write a, a script and it'll you know, just run it in the background. So, what are some reasons? I think there are three main reasons why it makes sense to use a tool like Python. The first is you're working with a lot of data. So, uh, you know, we're all probably pretty proficient with Excel. In fact, I when I teach you know, a lot of people here would say they're not technical, but the stuff you can do in Excel models my mind. <laughs> but there's a point where Excel this is not really the right tool, right? I mean, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of rows of data. You start getting to millions of rows, and Excel just, you know, slowly loads and then crashes. And uh, in this world of big data, you know, that's fine when you're dealing with, like, let's say, stock prices, right, for several years. Once you're working with, like, intraday stock prices, Every five minutes, every minute, every second, the data set just becomes way too large for a tool like Excel to handle. And Python can deal with that stuff like it's like butter. It's, it's mind bogglingly fast. So it's, in some cases, it's like the only tool that's available for doing what you want to uh, do. Second example you're doing something that's super easily automated. So you find yourself doing the same kind of task every week, every day, whatever it is, doesn't matter if it takes five minutes or if it takes you an hour. Right? If you could do it in your sleep, you could write a Python script to do it for you and just automate that whole part of your job out so that you could focus your time doing more interesting things. Um, and then there's, if you want to do something really complex that it would take you a very long time to do, or maybe it's not even possible with the tools you currently have available, Python can be really good for that too. So, you know, examples, like you can do stuff in Excel where you're plotting individual columns, you're doing linear regressions, you can do all that in Excel. But then let's say you have a lot of data and you want to figure out which three factors have the highest R squared and you want to iterate over thousands of different combinations, you're never going to do that in Excel. It doesn't make sense. But there are built-in ways in Python of doing that really, really quickly. So I just want to get a little bit of context as to like what are some problems you might look at where you might think, okay, Python could be a solution for this. And really this is true for all coding languages, right? Not just Python. Um, I'll caveat all this by saying Python is gigantic, and you really only need to know a tiny little bit of it. So when, when I'm first teaching people about coding, it's easy to get overwhelmed by just how massive it is. Okay? Uh, the same analogy applies for languages just generally. Um, so uh, did you know there are 1,025,109.8 words in the English language? I have no idea <laughs> what counts as point eight word. I mean, this is according to Google. <laughs> and yet, the average adult only knows 20 to 35,000, and that's like, that's us. 
Uh, and yet we're fluent, right? We don't know most of the words, and yet we have no problem conveying meaning, you know, expressing our desires, our wants, or whatever. Even the most you know, well-versed people in, in language, like typically doctors or lawyers, know about 50,000 words, but that's like really stretching it. You only know a tiny little bit, but it doesn't concern us all that much, right? Because we can do what we want to do, and Python is also very similar. Um, also, for those who are concerned that like they'll never be as good as like a, someone with a CS degree, 90% of developers are self-taught. So most of the people I know who are using code within their jobs have taught themselves. And it means that they don't know everything either. They just picked up little bits along the way of what's useful. Um, I just want to put that out there as a way to just make you realize, like, okay, it's okay to just know a little bit, to know enough to solve whatever problems you want to solve. So in that class, I teach like the 20% of Python that gives you like 80% of the way, in the Pareto principle. And so this uh, is sort of what I think of as the Python toolbox. Uh, you've got printing, comments, variables, numbers, math, strings, if, else, lists, loops, dictionaries, functions, and importing. We don't know what any of those concepts mean, so don't worry too much about it. <coughs> but with this, I would say you could do most of everything you want to do with Python. It's not even a fraction of all the things that are available, but a lot of those other things are just variations of these things. Um, and also, uh, Learning to code is kind of like a choose your own adventure. I don't know if anyone watched the Bandersnatch episode of Netflix, where you actually get to like, you're faced with all these choices and you get to choose what you want to do. And this is surprisingly accurate because sometimes when you're coding, you want to uh, throw tea at your computer or shout at your dad. Um, so, uh, you know, I show you something, and my goal is to give you a little bit of the language and kind of put the map in front of you that will then allow you to choose what you want to go and explore further. There's not really like a linear structure. You can decide, I really want to do web scraping and go deeper down that path. I really want to explore data analysis and go much deeper down that path. Um, I will say, I mean, in a, in a class like this, where it's very easy for me, as I said, to go a little bit too fast or forget that I haven't explained something, that if you're confused, ask a question. If you don't know what to ask, ask me two questions. Because for every person who's confused, there's like 10 other people who have the same question, but they're a little bit you know, embarrassed to ask. And for some reason, when it comes to the world of, of coding, it's easy to get embarrassed that like, oh, you, you missed something, or, uh, you know, you were stupid because you didn't have a chance about something. Like, that's absolutely not the case, and that's what I'm actively trying to fight against, the feeling of like, I'm not technical, so I can't learn this stuff because I'm just not, for some reason, feel that way, because I don't think that's true. Um, I'll also say that there are going to be TAs in this class. Um, so in, in actually the back corner, so uh, Corey and Ayushman, you can raise your hand, like literally in the back. If you are running into a problem at any point, you can flag them down, and they'll come over to you, and they'll help you sort of troubleshoot and figure it out. Because the worst thing in the world is when you're writing code, and it's not working, and then you're not listening to me, because you're trying to solve this, uh, and it's just a nightmare. So I found that this kind of works pretty well. Um, I'll do that. You can email them, I guess. But... Uh, so here's our path that we're following. Uh, intro to Python, that's what we're doing now. We'll talk about Python in a second. I'm going to show you a specific script. That's going to be the first thing we run. Then we're going to go very quickly through the basics of Python, like the 20% I showed you. Because this class is not about learning Python per se, it's about understanding the context of Python to get to some practical applications. We're going to walk through it together. So you're going to actually be doing this provided you install Python and you downloaded the files that were sent in advance. For some of you, this might be the first time you've heard that there were files and instructions sent in advance. So uh, Melina could send those to you, or I think the TA should have them as well, so you can get them um, before we start. Uh, but you know, if you didn't set it up, if you don't have the files, it's fine. You could still follow along with the class, maybe share with the person next to you, if they're friendly. Um, and you'll still learn something in this class, I promise. Um, so we're going to get into the data analysis portion of Python, which is one thing that actually get humming. And uh, hopefully we have time to get to textual analysis in Python as well, which is like along the lines of natural language processing, which is the, the next talk in the seminar series. And then we'll do a wrap-up. Um, as like a bit of a meta point, I'm going to plan for a 15-minute break at 7.30, because in three hours of coding is just like unfair and too much. <laughs> But we are going to be aiming to end at 9.15. I know the initial invitation is at 9 o'clock and three hours of stuff. So if you have to leave at like 9 o'clock, I understand. But just know that I'm shooting for 9.15. Um, and 
this is the agenda for today. I'll show that to you so we don't need to spend more time. Any questions about any of that so far before we get into the, the generally where you start? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes? What's the difference between Python and other languages? Great. Yeah, we'll get there. That's so uh, these are a bunch of different technical terms. You might not have even heard of any of these. It doesn't matter. But I know for me, before I jumped into learning how to code, uh, this is all I knew about coding. And it was like hella intimidating because I didn't know where to start. I didn't know, should I learn C or Java or PHP or any of these tools? And I think one of the biggest fears you have when you're getting started is that you're going to pick the wrong one. That you're going to go all the way down this path and then learn at some later point that, uh, you know, damn, like I should have learned R instead of Python. So uh, that's not actually the case. Like, I'll show you why you can pretty much learn any of these and make it easier for you to learn the other ones. But I, f I find that it's useful to sort of set the context of where Python, for example, fits in. Um, and I like to do that by talking about something called a web application. So uh, a web application is an application that you access over the internet. So a normal application is like an app on our phone. Or even um, things you download like PowerPoint is an application, Microsoft Word, Excel, even the browser is an application, you download them. But with a web application, you don't download it. Instead, you open up your browser and you go to a website. And the advantage there is the web application is on someone else's computer in the cloud. and You connect to it, but there can be like a shared database. So everyone is using the same web application together, and hence you have sites like Facebook and Twitter, and almost every site you use these days is a web application. This didn't used to be the case. You know, in the early days of the web in the 90s, it was just static websites. They were the same for everyone. It was just, you know, you didn't log in, but late in the 90s and early 2000s, things became web applications. And as a result, you know, you log into Twitter or Facebook, you see something that's custom for you. Nobody else sees the same thing. Every application has a front end and a back end, right? So think about breaking that into two parts. And the front end is the part you see. So um, the web pages themselves are designed with three programming languages, and they all actually work together. Uh, these three languages are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, to, get, to get the general idea, and we're not going into front end, but to get the general idea of how they work together, um, my friend Chris uses the analogy of, uh, of, of a sentence like the boy kicked the red ball. You've got nouns, you've got verbs, you've got adjectives. Uh, the HTML is the noun. It's the boy, it's the ball. It's what describes the things on the page. It's what creates the things on the page, right? Your text, your uh, like all the things that are there. But uh, with just the HTML, you don't have any visuals. It doesn't look a certain way. So the CSS is the adjective. It's the red part of the ball. It's what makes the page look the way it does. And so you've got HTML, defines what's there, and the CSS would make it look, look a certain way. If you've ever loaded a web page and it was just text, um, and it looked like something was broken, it's usually because the CSS part of the code is broken. And then the JavaScript is like the verb. It's what makes the page uh, interactive and do certain things. And so those three things play together to create the web pages, right? So that was probably the fastest ever front end coding lesson. But I, I went through that so I could uh, mention the back end, which is the part you don't see. Okay, it's the thing that creates the, the web pages. Um, the back end has these two parts. You've got a database, which is where everything is stored. Your users, your photos, your tweets, your status updates, events, whatever it is that the website it is, has. And then you've got the rules in between. Right? And the rules are kind of the most abstract thing, but here's an example. You know, you log into Twitter. Well, first of all, you, you give your username and your password, and it somehow has to figure out, oh, does that actually match what's in the database? There's a set of rules. There's functions and things like that in this process that go and check. Once you've logged in, you go to the home page or your news feed, and then it has to go figure out who are you following, and then what are their most recent tweets. And it grabs those from the database, and then it puts them into the page in an appropriate way, and then creates the page to show it to you. Um, in terms of languages, database languages, there's just one, and it's called SQL or SQL. Both of those are fine pronunciations of that. And it's been the same since like the 70s when I had it on that time. But in between is where you've got 
programming languages. And so I give the examples here of PHP, Python, Ruby, and Java. But it's really where almost all the other things I showed on that slide before, they fit in there. Okay, so this is kind of, you can use, these don't all work together, you pick one of them, but you could use just about any one of them. Um, I'm willing to argue, and I say a lot of controversial things, sometimes for simplicity, but sometimes because I think the specifics of what's actually true is totally unimportant to like most people. They're all the same, just a little different. So a good analogy of this is um, actual languages that we speak, right? I often get a question uh, from a student or you know, someone who emails me saying, okay, I've got this idea for like a website I want to build, and it's, you know, it's a social network for dogs or dog sitters or whatever. We pitch that a lot. Uh, do you think I should learn Python or do you think I should learn Ruby or PHP? Like, what do you think would be the best thing to learn to build this? Um, and the question is kind of a funny question once you actually know a little bit about how this process works. Because it's like, you know, let's say I was uh, an English teacher and someone said, hey, I've got this story I want to I want to write. It's like a beautiful love story, you know, between a boy and a girl and they can't be together because their families hate each other. Uh, you know, don't need to know the details, but what language should I write it in? Should I do it in English? Should I do it in French? Should I do it in Chinese? Like, doesn't really matter. You can tell the story in any of those languages. Doesn't mean they're all the same, right? And some languages have masculine and feminine nouns, and some languages do have tenses differently. But at the end of the day, you can construct the same meaning in all of them. And in the same way, you can write the like different looking code that produces the same output. Here's like the first example you'll always see in every program tutorials: code that produces hello. And when I was first starting, I was like, what do you mean produces? Like, what, what does running code actually mean? And we'll get there, but so just know, I'll show you how you run code, but here's just the example of the code on top, and then the output of that code on the bottom. And if you're astute, you can notice a lot of the differences. You know, PHP is, starts with echo, Python's print and Ruby's puts, PHP has a semicolon at the end, Python has parentheses around it, and the other two don't. But at the end of the day, they're relatively similar, which is why you know, when you learn one language, it's pretty easy to learn another language, because um, you just figure out, okay, what's the Ruby version of print, or something like that. Um, so then, zoom back even further. Python is just a language for humans to talk to computers. Uh, languages, generally, programming languages, started out being very computer-friendly, but not very human-friendly, um, and then they've gotten progressively more human-friendly over time. So I'll give an example. This is how you print winters coming in binary. And this isn't even true, because binary is zeros and ones, but this is like the next level up representation of zeros and ones, because it would just be too many zeros and ones for you to see. This is numbers that represent zeros and ones. But this is, at the end of the day, what's happening in your computer. But it's impossible for a human to read this and really have any understanding of what's going on. And people used to code using this, but like only for a very short period of time before they realized uh, this is tedious and we're never gonna be able to do anything cool with this. So, uh, they introduced this thing called assembly, which is just one level up from binary, and this is the way that you print Windows coming in assembly, and it just gets converted into what you saw before. And you start to get some readability, like you have words you recognize here at least, like section and start, but I would still argue that this is like not a fun way to code, um, and especially if you want to learn how to code quickly, to do things, you should never learn assembly. Um, or even Java, I think. And we teach Java in AP uh, computer science classes in high school, and I think it's the worst thing ever, because look, this is how you print winter is coming. It's better than the other two, right? I'll give you that. But you've got still things like okay, public, class, static, void, main, system, out, print, all that. There's so much you have to learn and sort of fit in your head before you can do something as simple as just print a little bit of text, right? And then you have Python, and it's just print, winter is coming. It's like, nice. <laughs> right? So this is one of the reasons why uh, coding has become more prevalent and more popular even for non-coders is because just fundamentally code has gotten easier to read, easier to understand, easier to learn. Um, you could do more with it without knowing as much and I think that's progress and I think that it's going to continue to progress you know, within our lifetimes. Python is not the end all be all, but you know, if you're worried about what comes next I'd say don't worry about it, like Python is here to say, and it is the fastest growing language and it's the most wanted and most popular language right now. 
Um, so what is Python? Uh, it was created by this guy in 1991. His name is Guido. Uh, he's also known as the benevolent dictator for life in the Python community because he's just like <laughs> such a nice guy. Um, it is named, there is this conception. It's named after Monty Python, not a snake. Um, he has a weird sense of humor. Um, if you're wondering who uses Python, it's basically every tech company ever. Um, it's almost silly to put a slide on it. You know, here's some examples. But any company that where anyone does any kind of data analysis is using Python. Some companies use Python as like the core of their main product. Um, that's not always the case. But even if they don't use Python for the core, they're still often using Python to do a lot of the odds and ends stuff for reasons that you know, I'll go into later when we start talking about the tools that are available in Python. Um, and then some examples. Recently, I've started seeing like Python crack into the mainstream. Economist did an article about Python and how it's brought computer programming to a vast audience. I uh, got Wall Street Journal talking about uh, Wall Street erasing the lines between its jocks and its nerds, and the emergence of straighters, you know, like coders and traders, doing kind of the job of ten, or, of ten traders before. Um, or even City now is uh, wants their analysts to have Python as a as a skill on their resume. Right, things that you would typically or traditionally would never have thought that you know a business person would do, they're starting to expect them to at least know a little bit of Python. Um, it's one of the fastest growing languages. So there's a graph according to uh, Stack Overflow does this annual survey of, of languages and which ones people use. Uh, and that's compared to JavaScript, Java, etc. And it's also one of the most wanted languages when they survey people. Which of these languages do you want to learn? It's like uh, or do you want people to use, it's at the top. Uh, we're going to be using Python 3, so you know we're not very far in, and already I'm throwing a wrench into like, this whole process, which is funny because Python 3 came out in 2008, so 11 years ago. For some reason, a lot of people still use Python 2. It's the last major version. Uh, so for example, if you go to Code Academy, which is like this online code learning site, they teach Python 2. Um, and there's this website that catalogs the top like 360 most popular libraries, and it's been keeping track of how many of them have been updated for Python 3. And at this point, it's almost all. But this kind of gets at the reason why it took so long, because uh, there were a lot of companies and there were a lot of coders who built tools in Python 2. And then when they released Python 3, they did not make it easy for people to upgrade. And so a lot of people just thought, I'll get around to it when I get around to it. There's not really an incentive to do it. They kind of messed up the whole upgrade process, and it was used as a case study of like, how do you build reverse compatibility into programming languages, uh, which is an interesting thing, I think, to think about from a business perspective, right? But they did it wrong, and so now they've learned from their mistakes. But we're at the point now where when people are starting, more people are using Python 3 than Python 2, 11 years later, and they're going to discontinue support for Python 2 starting in 2020. So it's a good thing to start to learn. Just so you know, you don't really have to worry that much about that. Yes. Who are they that are discontinuing support? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so Python is a man-made language, and so it's created. It was created by Guido initially. Now there's a, a group of core developers who are constantly working on the language, meaning they're making upgrades, they're fixing bugs, they're improving things, making things faster. So there's this core community um, who are making these active decisions, and then there's even broader communities who are not working on Python per se. But are working on tools that are like plugins to Python. I mean, it's thousands of people at this point, right? Even though the core community might be, you know, a dozen or a few dozen people. Because it's not a product, right? There's no one no, selling it's a, Python. Exactly. It's it's uh, it falls into this world of open source software, which means that no specific company built it and is selling it. There are programming languages that were designed and built by companies, and you have to pay to use it, and you know, there's an expensive license and whatever. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why Python became so popular. Um, and it's also an interesting sort of business case because when Google first started, they wrote their scrapers in Python in like the, you know, the 90s. Uh, if you look back at the white paper, they, it, when they were at Stanford, they have the Python code showing how, to, how they are scraping sites. And then uh, when they started to get big, they hired the guy who invented Python. And they allowed him to spend a bunch of his time just working on Python, saying, we're not going to try to own it. We're going to sort of give back to the community. But it was smart because 
Um, as a result, anyone who was smart graduating from like you know, CS departments that wanted to learn Python from the best people would then go to Google. So they had this sort of natural funnel of high quality talent. And then Dropbox hired me though, so he was at Dropbox for a while as well. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting shift from the, the business model uh, perspective around these languages. Um, so, honestly, the only thing you really need to know about the difference between them, though, is this. So on the left, it's how you break the numbers coming. On the right, it's how you do a Python 3. You can probably figure out the right one uses parentheses. That's it. Like, when you look at code online that other people have written, and you'll do a lot of that, by the way, um, the average developer uh, searches Google at least once for every 10 lines of code that they write, because they don't know how to do something. And that's like experts. So. Uh, in my class, I actually teach people how do you Google, and then how do you how do you use these question and answer sites to ask a question to make it uh, more likely that you'll get an answer quickly. It's actually a skill. Um, so when you're finding these code snippets, this is probably the biggest giveaway that the code you're looking at is in Python 2, and if you just put parentheses, it'll work. Um, that's all I have to say about that. So I think it's uh, a good time to actually like dive into our first. Python script, if we're cool with that. Yeah. All right. So, um, so hopefully everyone at this point has installed Python. Uh, what was sent out is basically instructions for going to this website called Anaconda, which is a company, it's like an enterprise data science platform. They do have, this is a business, but they did create this downloader, which allows you to install Python and a bunch of the biggest data science tools, totally free. And so, you know, some a lot of times it's quite complicated to install programming languages and set it up, and everyone does it a different way. So it's nice to have a like an installer that does it consistently. This is what I usually encourage my classes to use, because it also comes with all the other tools which we're going to end up using anyway. So if you didn't do it, uh, you know, you could try to do it now and try to catch up, but it, it's a big file and it kind of takes a while. So I think at this point you might just consider following along just like watching as opposed to doing it. But if you've set it up, then good. Um, so, and then the second thing was that there were these three files that were emailed to you um, before this class, I think last night. So there's uh, three files and a CSV file. Sorry, so three, it's four files. A CSV file and then three of these other files, which if you try to open, won't work. Um, you know, you may not, this is a, my default open thing, and this doesn't mean anything. This isn't actually code. I'll show you how you can open these files later. But, um, so you want to have these ready. Um, the best thing to do would be to have them somewhere readily available. Doesn't matter where you put it. I would recommend, you know, for this class, just create a folder on your desktop, call it Python or code or something like that, and move it into there. Um, it's easy to just, it's better to just have it in its own folder as opposed to in like your downloads folder where you have a bunch of other files. But it doesn't matter as long as you know how to get there. Um, okay, so there's actually a lot of ways that you can run Python code. So when I was first thinking about doing this workshop, I was like, well, do I want to show you how to write code in the text editor and then run in the command line, which was like, no, that's, there's a little bit too much overhead there. That's how I usually teach it in my class and there's like a 15 minute intro to the command line, but we want to get to the cool stuff faster. So we're going to go directly to like a data science tool that happens to be the most popular tool used for data science these days. It's called uh, Jupyter Notebook. So I'm just going to open the website and you just search Jupyter Notebook and it's with a Y. You don't need to search. So I'll just show you. Um, it used to be called IPython for interactive Python and it's another one of these open source tools that was just built by the community. Uh, why do we use something like this? Well, it allows you to write Python code, but also visualize stuff like do plotting um, and a lot of the stuff you would want to do when you're doing data analysis all in one place. As opposed to when you're just working with text, it's really hard to do anything visual. It's got a lot of other really cool features, um, but I'm going to show you how to run it. We're going to go through it and then we can talk more about it. Uh, so, how do, you, how do you actually open it? Because you installed it. You might not have realized it, but it became installed with Python. So, uh, the easiest way to run Jupyter Notebook is to search for this thing called Anaconda Navigator um, that came with the installer. Open that up, and it looks like 
this. It's going to be a green circle that initializes. And then you should see something like this. So I had everyone walk through this during the installation steps just to make sure it worked well. So we're going to go through the same step. Uh, and then you find Jupyter Notebook and you click Launch. There's a bunch of these other tools. I haven't used most of them, so you don't need to worry too much about what they do. Um, you just click Launch. It opens up this thing very briefly, and then it opens up a web page for you. So you should see something like this. Yes? So could you explain the difference between Anaconda, Anaconda Navigator, Jupyter, are these like plugins, or is Jupyter a plugin that goes, you know? Yeah, so Anaconda is this company that is like, has all sorts of data um, analysis tools, and there's a platform. I don't even honestly know what the business model is, but they provided this like installer package, this thing that installs everything for you. So the installer installs Python, and it installs this thing, which is called Jupyter Notebook. Anaconda didn't build Python, they didn't build Jupyter Notebook. Each both of those are independently created by like a different group of coders who are always working on this online. A lot of them work at other companies, and they're just doing this as a hobby on the side in order to like advance the data science community. Um, so they're all independent, but as I'm, I'm gonna show you, you can use this to run Python code. It's not the only way to run Python code, but it is a convenient way to run Python code. Um, I, it's still really abstract, so I understand it's not super clear to you. We haven't even read it. Uh, so what you're seeing here is basically a visualization of what's on your computer. So it, even though it's in a browser, it looks like it's a website. It's not exactly a website. Um, it is technically it's a web application that's just running on your computer, and it's it shows you stuff that's on your computer. So it's it's actually the same as you know, if I went here and I like navigated it back back. Like <coughs> this is the same as what I'm seeing in both places, right? Just so you know that. Um, so the key here, let's minimize this in the background. The key here is we can use Jupyter Notebook to open up those special files that I sent to you. Right? These files with the extension .ipymb, which stands for IPython Notebook. Um, you know, if you know where they are, and then you go into here and you find them. So if they're on your desktop, you would go into desktop, and then. You should, in my case, I see my Python folder. I would click on that, and I see the files. So right now, I want everyone to follow along, and, and they should get to the same point, where wherever the files are on your computer, you need to be able to see them using Jupyter Notebook. So sometimes, if you move them somewhere, it'll make it easier for you to find, or harder for you to find, depending on if, if you know how to navigate. Right? So just by default, you will open up this place, which will always have a desktop folder on it, so that's an easy place to go. But if you put it in your documents, then you can click documents, and every person's folder structure is different, so it's this hard thing at this point to uh, deal with. So also, if you have a question, again, raise your hand, and the TA will come and find you. Go to TA's attention. Okay. Yeah, just already generally asking. Yeah, so this is all well and good, but now I guess I see all of my files from my desktop now, like on the internet. Is that this is not on the internet? Okay. So no one else can see this. Okay. This is just your computer. Yeah. So so don't worry about that. Yes. Uh, why we download the file? Uh, yes. The name change. Don't need to change the name. No, our name is like a name. So yeah, they were really weird names. Yeah. Oh. Because we downloaded from. So if you just open the file, you can change the name. You can change the names to whatever you want. I'm not sure if the name. Let's see what the name is. I can, I can give a little explanation about why it's not. Okay, what is that? So I believe she used our stocknet mailing list. Yeah. And what they do is when they get those files, when you attach them as an attachment, the system takes them, yanks them, and puts like a, a long binary string. Okay. And so cool. that's how it presents it to you. All right. So let me, let me sort of reiterate what I heard. The mailing system that we use for sending out the files, just change the name of the file. It's not. It's not a horrible thing. It's just that the name was changed. Uh, it makes it hard for you to know which file is which, but I'll show you which one we want to open first. You can rename them on your own or just know which one to go to. So, and I'll do this because then there's like five minutes of exploration and I'll be able to help. What's that? Size of the file should go by size. So here's what we want. Um, if you find the files, it should, you should see the, they look a little different. The first is called Intro to Jupyter Notebook. It's the smallest file, it's 3.03 kilobytes. 
if you open it, it'll open a new tab, and I want you to follow the instructions in the new tab. I'm going to give you five minutes or so to go through it on your own, and we'll help uh, deal with anyone who currently has questions. It gives you a little bit of an overview of the interface, but then we're going to review this together as well. It should look like this when you open it. So don't open the file directly. Uh, it's hard to undo. The junior notebook is not good about letting you undo stuff. It's not good about undo. <laughs> yeah, there is one, one thing to be aware of. There you go. So sometimes edit undo works, but it's not always great, so don't rely on it. Thank you. 
So I'm not sure how to download it. Because you know what you're saying. You can just do that. So Maybe email Molina and she can send you the CSV file directly. Or email one of the teams. Or just it's too long, or what's the problem? So just instead of a link, just send the actual CSV. Yeah. All right, let's. We got a lot to get through. I know that not everyone's there, so I'll, I'll talk about some of the first few things I saw. First of all, if you were like paying attention to download the files, you might have missed the step where I said you have to open up Jupyter Notebook to run the files, right? So you, if you have the files, you can't just open them directly, okay? So once you have the files, you then have to open up this thing called Anaconda Navigator. It's a it's its own software. You have to find Jupyter Notebook and click launch. Then you can use that to open the files. It seems a little roundabout, and it is, admittedly. Um, but that's how it works. It's like, this is how their proprietary system works. The other thing is, uh, it seems like the, the org sync system, some people have trouble like downloading the actual files from there. So um, is it possible to send out the files like manually? Or if, if the person next to you has the files, you can just ask them to email it to you. I don't know most people's like, email system, so I can't give people individual advice about how to download files. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll move on. But, uh, so what this is, is this interface that lets you write basically text and code together. And think of it sort of as like Microsoft Word that you can run code inside of. Uh, so, in the instructions, I kind of gave you an overview of some of the things you can do here. Uh, you can create cells, delete cells. Uh, when you get down here, this is what actual code looks like in Jupyter Notebook. You can tell it looks different from all the text and stuff above it. And each of these is called a cell. A cell is really just like a thing that you can write code in. And then you can run a cell. To a certain degree, they're individual. So you can run one cell at a time. Um, so if you click into there, and you can either click run or hit shift enter, and it runs it. We know that it's run because the thing on the left of it got updated and it says IN1, so the number one is there. While it's running, there's actually an asterisk, but it happens really quickly, so uh, you know, it'll get updated to this number. And then if you run the next cell, shift enter, you should see that gets run. Now it says in two, and then you see the thing below. Uh, this congratulations thing basically carried over from the line before to the next line, and so we're running Python code, and you can do a lot in here. And I have a file we'll go through quickly, sort of showing you the basics of Python and the things that we can do. Um, and then I have a few notes below. Uh, so a few things to realize about this whole interface. The first thing is, uh, let's say you shut this down. The file actually still is running in the background. As you can see, there's this little green thing. So if, you, if I click on that and I shut down, now it's not running anymore. I open it up again. Um, and if I went down here, it looks like uh, the code, like everything I did before is saved there. And that's actually a convenience. If I write code, run it, put some text, and I want to, let's say, I send it to my coworker, it allows them to see the results of everything that I did which is one of the reasons it's often used for data analysis. You can walk people through the steps that you're following. Uh, the thing is, these cells are not run now. This is just a snapshot of what was run last time. So if I went directly to the second and I tried to run it again, I'm going to get an error. And the error here, this is what an error looks like in this. It's really confusing and kind of scary. But the, it, the key is usually the last line tells you what the error is. And here it says name error, name congratulations is not defined. I don't have much time to get into errors in Python, but essentially what's happening is the line above it hasn't been run. 
even though it looks like it was run. So usually what you do if you get sent a new Jupyter Notebook file is you go up to kernel and you just click restart and run all. That's an easy way for it to just go through the entire thing and run every single cell from the top to bottom. You could do it manually and just click and then shift enter, shift enter all the way down, but that's a shortcut. There's also another shortcut under cell, which is uh, run all or run all above or run all below. So just so you know that's available. It'll make more sense when you see other files that have a lot more code in them. Um, the other thing is, uh, like you said about like, is this on the web? It's not, and in fact, um, this thing that opened in the background, uh, and it's got crazy green text and stuff, it's actually kind of keeping a log just for you of what is happening. So every time you run something here, you see this update. If you shut this down, this will stop working. Okay, so every time you want to go into here, you actually have to go into the navigator and launch Jupyter Notebook. If you shut this down, even though the page will be open, it'll, it'll say this big pop-up and say, cannot connect. So you'd have to go through the same steps every time you want to work with a file like this. Just so you know. So, again, what's the point of this? Um, one thing that's cool about this is you can use many languages in a tool like this, so not just Python. It lets you use R and Scala and, and different things. You can put interactive elements in here, so widgets, inputs, all sorts of things like that. And it's a really nice interface for sharing text alongside it. So I'll actually show you one of my favorite blog posts. It's called The Waiting Time Paradox. <coughs> um, and it talks about this paradox of uh, the bus being late. So here's the general setup of it. Let's say you have a bus schedule where the bus shows up every 10 minutes, right? And you've got people that come to the bus stop uh, randomly distributed. Like sometimes people show up and the bus just left so they have to wait 10 minutes. Sometimes they show up and the bus gets there right in time so they hop right on, you know? So the question is, what's the average amount of time when you sample people that they have to wait for the bus? Now intuitively the answer, well some people get there and they have to wait 10 minutes and some people get there and it's there, should be somewhere in between, like around five minutes, right? But the, the truth is that the average wait time actually ends up being twice that, 10 minutes, even though it's 10 minutes between buses, which seems really weird, right? So that's why it's called paradox. Um, and the answer is kind of tricky, but it has to do with uh, sampling error. Like, if you're sampling people randomly, unless you sample everyone, you know, you show up randomly at a bus stop, you ask people how long have you been waiting, it's more likely that they've been waiting for a while because the person who just got there and got on the bus, you can't sample them, they already left, right? So you're, you're sort of pushing it, and obviously there's you know, randomness here. So this blog post talks about this, I don't know that much more about it, because I'm not back in statistics, but it talks about it, and then if you go down, it actually shows you a simulation of how it figures this out. So in the blog post, you actually see these bits of code, and the format should be familiar at this point. This is like a Jupyter Notebook file, or the style of a Jupyter Notebook file. In this case, I can't edit it, but there are versions of these online that you can actually run code and try it out. So here, he shows you he's actually creating uh, a, hundred, a million buses, 100,000 buses, with 10 minute wait time in between, and creating some random uh, arrivals, and then calculating intervals, and then showing you that the interval, the average wait time is 10 minutes. And then it goes further, and you can actually see you know, formulas and charts, uh, which is cool. Right? So this is like data analysis right here. Um, and so we can use a notebook to do this, essentially. So that's kind of what I'm going to show you how to do in today's class. Cool. <laughs> um, OK, so we can close down the intro to Jupyter Notebook file. The next one is called Happy Hour. So I want to open it up. It's relatively short. It just looks like this. And here, before I teach you anything about Python, this is usually what I do in my first class, is I give a script, and then I have you run the script. So you know, remember how you run this? This is a giant cell. You just click anywhere inside of it, and you can either click Run or hit Shift N. So I want you to run the cell, and then see what the output is below the cell. And then what I want you to do is click in the cell again, run the cell again, and then see what the output is, and keep running it. See if you can figure out what's going on, how, what it's doing. Once you've looked at the output a few times, what I want you to do is actually read through the code. So take a, take a minute or two, read through line by line, and you know, see what you notice. You might not understand all of it, you might have questions about certain things, but see what comes up, and then uh, after about a minute, we'll get back together and then we'll talk about 
into this code, how it works, and how I'm in with it. Do have any questions still at this point? Are you done? Yeah. No, it's not very advanced. I'm starting to come up with some ideas. I, mean, I can tell you to do that, but I'd rather you play around with it. Yeah, you try to get rid of stuff. Oh, because you changed that, right? Oh, okay, because you changed Oh, you have an old version of Python. Did you write it to people that have to get stuff? Did you install these in the same stuff as all structures? Or did you have to play this for example? Yeah, there's three people. so you rerun it. If you want to rerun it, click in the cell and then hit run. Right? Because what happens is every time you run a cell, it creates a new one below and then it focuses in there. So you'll have to refocus up in the previous cell and then hit shift enter. And then refocus. So you have to keep clicking. Uh, so that's an error, which means you might have changed something. Or, you have, did you have a previous version? Yeah, you will be able to do most of the stuff in I don't know exactly what area you're in, but if I did, I can help So, this will require you to have the most recent version of Python installed. If you have an older version of Python installed, you'll get an error when you try to run this code. Right? Especially if you have Python 2. This is one of those examples. Yeah. Are you asking why I have it out? Good question. Um, okay, so let's regroup real quick. A few of you have probably came up with questions as you were reading through the code, codes, such as why is there an F before the quotation mark? Uh, my first answer when people ask questions like this is like, I don't know, try getting rid of it and see what happens. <laughs> right? Because you can learn a lot about how, I mean, these are man-made languages, right? Uh, to every question you have, there is an answer. I might know it, and if I do, it's because I had the question at some point and I tried it or I looked it up. What's that? So, here's an example. Like, what's the F do? Let's get rid of it and run it, and you see that the output now has those little squiggly things. Uh, it doesn't stand for function. Uh, <laughs> but now it takes it away if you remove it. What's that? If you remove it, it takes it away. Yeah, it takes it away. It technically stands for formatter, formatter okay. string. Uh, but it's just an F. I don't like the F because it's obviously it's not clear. It doesn't make sense what it means. Essentially what happens is if you put the F in front of something with quotes, then you can run Python code inside of the quotes. In this case, we're putting variables in it. I have a separate file where I actually go through the Python basics, but what I wanted to demonstrate is, without knowing anything about Python code, you can look at this and get a pretty good understanding of what's going on, right? You, you might, you know, the first line probably doesn't mean all that much to you, but then here you've got, you know, a list of bars, and here you've got a list of people, and here you've got, 
you know, you're doing some work, you're choosing a random person, you're choosing a random bar, and then you're putting them in here to print it out, right? I generally think of code as having like a top, middle, and bottom, where the top does a little bit of setup, like you know, what, are your, what, what are your lists, what are the things you're importing. The middle does some work, like we're picking some random person, we're maybe doing some math, and then the bottom gives you your output, right? But, and that's not all that important, but what is important is, I'm gonna now give you a challenge, okay, which is I'm gonna give you five minutes to solve these three problems, uh, which you can do either individually or with a partner. So the first is I misspelled Samuel the Axis, which is a typo the first time I did this. So can you fix that? Can you do that to work? The second is can you add another friend's name to the list or, um, or another bar to the list as well? And then the third is can you have it print out two random people instead of one? It's obviously the hardest, I'll give you five minutes. So in the list, his name is spelled wrong. So can you fix the spelling of his name? Did you see in the list of people? As in, like, not changing that? No, change, change it in there. Yeah. It's a relatively easy text. Yeah, it's not a trick. Yeah, I thought he had to, like, find two. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of people are asking me, how do you get it to print two different people? That's the challenge. See if you can figure it out. If you can't, it's okay. I'll show you how to do it after five minutes. Yeah. That's a good question. See if you can come up with a theoretical solution to it. No, it's a great question. That's like exactly where I I'm 
There's a function called working. Usually I don't teach that until the second class. Cool, like Python lists, removing from a list. So, two ways of doing it, right? Two lists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's like a second order for the right. You look at Python. You can do it or my list. Look up Python removed from a list. I think it's an if then. Yeah, just pick some. Okay. Let's 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 regroup because a lot of people are getting very excited about stuff, and I think that's awesome. We have a lot to do. So the first thing is, you know, pretty easy. Obviously, just change the name. And you run it, and then eventually you'll see if the name's updated. The second is adding another person to the list. This is just more sort of pattern recognition. If you notice a list is this thing within these square brackets, so you want to make sure you add someone in between there. You put a comma in between stuff, and then you just put another row, right? So you have um, and then run, and then eventually, you know, it'll show up. Oops, I had something. Um, the next one is sort of the most complicated, right? So first, what you might have done is just put and random person, and then the problem is you will realize that it's just the same person every time, right? So then you might go a step further and say, okay, let's pick another person. Random underscore person <coughs> two equals random uh, choice people. And that's just sort of borrowing from the way it did above, and then you have to did this one here, and that's pretty good, um, except that eventually you'll realize that in some cases this is the same person. There we go. So actually, the odds here are uh, one in five, right? You pick one person, you pick from the same list. Every one in five times, it's going to be the same person, right? So then I did that on purpose because now you're thinking, okay, how do I solve that? Any ideas? Do I? Do you? If right, so you have that similar. If you if you're familiar with the concept of an if in Excel, you check to see if two things are the same. Uh, you can say, okay, if these two things are the same, pick another random person. That's one way to solve. Any other ideas? Yeah. Can you say that random person two has to be different from random person one? Uh, by just like forcing it when they pick. Yeah. That's it's possible. I don't know. Because it could be part of the function. Yeah. You can you can use random sample. Random sample. Yeah. yeah, so there's actually a, right, there's, that's tricky. I don't know how you know that. It took me a while to figure that one out. <laughs> there's a way to pick more than one from a list, and that function will make sure it's not, they're not the same. Yes? Uh, you remove the first one? Yeah, you remove the first person from the list before you pick the second person. It's totally another reasonable option. These are all pretty, yeah, do you have another one? You can divide for the two lists, I mean, you can divide the list into different ones. Oh, that's an interesting one. I've never heard that actually. I've heard people suggest make two different lists to pull from, which will guarantee that they're not the same, but maybe it doesn't accomplish exactly what you're trying to do. But you're suggesting just divide it in half and then pick from one and pick from the other. That'll totally work. But it will make sure that your first person is from the first half and the second person is from the second half. These are all great ideas. Yeah. So we uh, have one picked up and then the other says is a not function or? Just check to make sure they're not the same. So like an if. Yeah, the funny thing about if is uh, if you say if they're the same, pick another person. Well, then there's it's still possible that other person's the same. So you'd have to do some sort of continuously check until the person's not the same. Uh, these are all great solutions. You don't know how to do any of them yet, but you know if you learn more about Python, uh, 
you know, you, you decide which of these to do. And that's one of the cool things about coding is that like there's five different ways of doing anything, and so it starts to actually become somewhat creative. Like you decide what do you remember, what do you prefer doing. There might be some advantages of doing it one way or the other. Um, but that's where I'm going to leave it for now. It's a bit of a mystery. The next thing, <laughs> uh, the last one is basics of Python. And then we're going to actually be creating our own files. So if you open basics of Python, this is, this is essentially the first three classes that I teach in my Python class, just packed into one Jupyter Notebook file. Um, I'm going to give you now about five minutes to go through this on your own. This is the 10 things that you need to know. And it introduces each concept sort of one at a time. If you have questions that come up as you're going through this, just jot them down and then we can talk about them all together. But um, a good idea would be to, to go and run all of these, right? Um, and, and it'll sort of rerun, and then you can pick up wherever and play around with it. Otherwise, you might end up with errors because it might rely on code. Cool. Cool. I'll give you five minutes to do it this time. <coughs> In fact, um, it's, you totally don't have to get to this, but if you're feeling ambitious and you've gotten through it, here's a, a bit of a challenge, which is to generate a tip calculator. The idea of the tip calculator is uh, you can do this with partner or by yourself. Uh, get a tip, you get a bill amount, a total bill amount, and then suggest three random tips. 18%, 20%, 20%. But that's only if you've gotten through the code and you want to try to tackle it. If you don't want to get there, that's fine. It's a lot. It's three weeks for this year. This is not a basic kind of this is data analysis class. Does this work? Yes. That's, and that's how I was wrong.
I'm just going to go back to the last left for a shortcut for uh, how to do this. Uh, okay, so right here has a space. Are the number of decimals? Yes. When you, so when you, if you have a string, you know, and it's like format one text. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you mean here? Like dot? Yeah. Like in in dollars, so slash it well, we haven't worked with data sets yet, but I'll show you. I know. All right, let's let's pick up because the goal of where I want to get us to is to show you how to run a linear regression and do plotting. Right, so the difficult thing about this, obviously, and I don't want to spend um, a whole class just covering Python, even though you could spend, you could do an entire semester on just this you know, Jupyter notebook and never get to any of the cool stuff, which I think is one of the problems with how coding is often taught. I prefer to show people the cool stuff so that they have a reason to learn this, right? <laughs> so they find this interesting. This is way more interesting once you need to know this to solve a problem that you're actually trying to solve. So uh, the last thing you'll note, if you didn't make it to the bottom, um, is that there's, I actually show you how you can install a package from the internet, run it, and then get stock prices. And in the next example, we're gonna be analyzing stock prices, we're gonna be pulling data from a CSV, pulling data from an API, getting like live updated stock prices, and running a regression on those things. Um, so you can close this out, and we're now in uncharted territory, and we're gonna create our own and start from scratch, essentially. Which is also probably the hardest part of the class because I'm going to be writing code and you're going to be following along with it. And it's very easy for you to get, you know, to miss something, like to miss a comma or to miss a parentheses or a quotation mark. And then what you're doing won't work. And then you'll you know, spend a bunch of time trying to fix it. It's very hard to match the pace of everyone. So I'm going to try my best. But just know that it can be frustrating just for the very reason that you're like copying from what I'm doing. So I'll try to go slow. Um, because I recognize that this is difficult. Uh, what we will rely on at this point is this fred underscore data.csv file. So make sure you have that CSV file available and in the same folder um, as everything else. Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a notebook, a new notebook file, and we're gonna import that data set is one of the first things we did. Okay. So we start by creating, yeah? Sorry, the Excel file, does it have to be in CSV? Yes. Because I, for some reason, I changed to Excel. So just change it to a CSV file. That'll be the easiest. There is a way to import Excel into this, but I'm going to show you the CSV version, so it just makes it easier, if we all have the same thing. Um, so you create a new file by going up here to the top right, where it says New, clicking on that, and then clicking Python 3. You can create a new text file and folder or whatever, but uh, here we have Python installed, so we'll be able to create a file that lets us run Python code inside. Just go click new and then Python create. We'll leave this up here long enough for most people to get it. Okay, so if you click on this, it'll open a new tab with basically an empty notebook. So this empty notebook has a cell ready for us to type stuff. You'll see at the top it's untitled, and if, if I click to the other tab, I now have this untitled file. So uh, the first thing is you probably want to change the file to some name. And you can do that by clicking on untitled. When you hover over it, you'll see it becomes gray, and then you click on it. And I'm going to rename this 
um, four, because I'm going in the <coughs> order, and I'll just call it data analysis in Python. Doesn't really matter what you call it, as long as it's not on Python. And once you click rename, you'll see the files updated and the actual file name on your computer is updated as well. Again, up there, if you click on untitled, that's where you go to change the name of the file. I think you can also file rename. We'll do the same thing. <coughs> By the way, in case anyone's curious, under help, there's all the keyboard shortcuts. So if you're one of those like Excel, memorize all the shortcuts thing, there's Oh, you know, a lot of shortcuts for you to memorize here. So uh, this is where we start, and I will tell you, I, you know, you can write code, but you can also do text stuff. Um, the way you do text is different from code slightly. You start with a cell that you could write code into. This drop down here, you click on it. You see how it says code? If you want to do text, you click on it and you switch to Markdown. Markdown is kind of a language, like a programming language, that lets you do text formatting and stuff like that. It's very limited in terms of like, um, you know, what's available. But I'll show. I'll just teach you some of the basic stuff. So when you click Markdown, you'll notice that the cell, the thing on the left, disappeared. So it no longer says I N bracket. So now I can put something like uh, pound sign space, and then like data analysis in Python. And then when I run this, it'll just be the title of the file. So essentially, I'm not running Python code, I'm running Markdown, and it just produces like formatted text. Which is, you, in order to do this, you have to first change the cell to Markdown after you click it. Which is something to do. When I run it, it looks like that. You don't need, if you do the pound sign, it's like a big text. If you do two pound signs, it's two, and so on and so forth. You get smaller. Yeah. I think we have some questions here, so just make sure the TA there. Okay, so just the title of the file. Um, I'm going to start by importing a few different um, like tools or packages we're going to use inside this file. The first is, in the basics of Python file, you will notice that there were all these different data types, there were lists, there was something called a dictionary. What Python doesn't have is a table by default. So if you're dealing with tabular data, how do you do that in Python? Well, uh, people realized this, and they basically wrote an extension to Python, and they called it, you know, they cutely named pandas. Um, and if you search for pandas, you'll see that it's the Python data analysis library. It's probably one of the most popular data analysis libraries available. It's not part of Python, but it's so commonly used that it came with the installer that we used. Um, so in order to like add it to Python, you add import pandas, and then you run that cell. So now, essentially, I've, I've upgraded Python to be able to do this functionality and borrow from the functionality of pandas, which I'll show you, you know, what you can do with yeah. So if it doesn't say one, you're in Markdown. So you know you need to run this in Python mode, import pandas. I'll then show you what you can do with that once we're going to import a few of the different libraries. You can do all of this in one cell. So I'll put all the imports in the same cell. Um, we can do it in a different cell. I'll do it in a different cell. The next one is this one looks a little different. Uh, percentage sign. Map, plot, lib, space, inline. So this is a plotting library. So this is what we use to do graphing, charting, um, scatter plots, and things like that. It's called matplotlib. This is the only one that has a percent sign in front of it, so just be aware. And zoom into it. And just run all of these as you're going to make sure you didn't make a typo. It's um, you know, easy to mess up something. What's that? Inline. So if you don't run this, when you try to plot, you won't see any of the charts actually no. show up. The command inline works. Well. It makes the chart show up inline. Yes. So uh, this uh, matplotlib is it a part of pandas or? No, it's so matplotlib is basically a port of like the charting functionality of MATLAB in Python. Oh. So you know, the website for this shows you we'll be able to use this to do all sorts of different kind of graphs, like pretty advanced graphs using Python. 
I'll, I'll, I'll actually show you how to use all of these letters. Using pair symbols is uh, artificial to What's that? Using pair symbols is it? No, not exactly. This is the only one that is a percent of signs, and it's not the same. Uh, okay, the next one is, is called Seaborn. So you import Seaborn. This is another plotting library that works a little differently from Matplotlib. I'll show you the examples of when you would use one versus the other. This is a more statistical plotting library. So you can do regressions, you can do confidence intervals, and things like that. These all came with uh, the Anacondas installer. Uh, the next one doesn't come with the installer. We have to install it. Um, and this is called uh, IEX Finance. So if you ran the entire basics of Python file, it'll, it actually installed it for you. But if you didn't run it, I'll show you how you would install it. There's a shortcut for doing an installation inside of here. And that's um, exclamation point pip pip install and then IEX finance like that. Uh, when you run this, it will actually go and download this package from the internet and install it on your computer so that you can then import it into your file and use the functionality. What IEX Finance is, is a, it's a Python tool built by this organization called the Investors Exchange, and it allows you to get stock prices, historical stock prices, current stock prices, um, and a bunch of other financial information. There's a lot of different libraries for doing this, but IEX Finance is maybe the easiest to use as a beginner because you don't have to register an account for it. So they just make this publicly available. So when you run this, you should get a lot of text like this. And in my case, everything's already installed, so it just tells me um, requirement already satisfied. But if you don't have it installed, it'll actually install it and see some installation bars and things like that. Okay. And I confirm that this worked. The installation step might not work for everyone, unfortunately. Um, sometimes the network that we're on is a little weird, so I think if you're on like the guest network, you might get an error when you're trying to install. Um, I haven't found a good workaround. Sometimes tethering to your phone works. Running this at home could also work. There's just, we're dealing with the internet at this point, so there's a whole bunch of things that could go wrong. It's hard to troubleshoot everyone with this. So hopefully you're able to do this and install IEX Finance. Yes? If we already did, should we just delete this line, or does it matter? It doesn't matter, because this, You'll see in my case, I have it installed, it doesn't do anything. If you want, you can delete it, it'll clean it up, and that's fine as well. So you know, I can click on here, hit D twice, and it just deletes the stuff. Yeah. If it says downloading and then it provides a link, does that mean it's... You it shouldn't have to do it, you shouldn't have to click on anything for it to work. Um, all the way at the bottom, it should say successfully installed IX Finance, if it did. I might tell you where I downloaded it from, in case you're curious, in this website. Well, it's maintained by the people who run Python, and they keep track of all these things on that. OK. Um, the next thing is we're going to use a library for statistical regressions. And so we'll import that. This is the last thing we have to import. It's called stats, models. Oh, I forgot to import IEX finance. Import IEX finance dot stocks. So this one looks a little different. You add dot stocks at the end. If you run this and it says module not found, IEX finance, it's because you didn't install it. Module not found? Uh, yeah, but it, it's already saying requirement already satisfied. Sometimes computers are even installed that they can't find it. So that might be some custom work that is required. And the last one was import stats models API. And this is the library we'll use for running linear regressions, and uh, this is sort of the statistical package we'll use. Um, this is all that you'll need, and we're going to take a break. We'll reconvene at 745. And then in the second half of the class, I'll show you how you use these to run in their regression. Okay, so in the second half of this class, I'm going to show you how to use most of these libraries. So what we did right before the break was I had you import Pandas, Seaborn, MyPlotLib, IEX Finance, 
and stats models, they all do different things. We'll go through them in order. They're not all necessary. Like if I'll show you something and if you wanted to do that, you'd only need that library, right? Um, also, I'm gonna kind of show you a lot of really cool things you can do in Python, but I'm not exactly gonna show it to you at a pace in which you're necessarily gonna understand all of the different pieces. So it's a little bit more just like, look at these things that you can do, and here's how you can explore them further. And I'll give you resources um, on the back end. I'll show you a few different uh, online guides, videos, the things you can read to dive deeper. I'll also make these files available for you to go through on your own. If you are in trouble with your own stuff, we'll send that out later. Um, yeah, but I'll also, you know, ideally you're able to follow along. I'll also say for this stuff, because it can be hard to read, I recommend for people in the back to sit up front. Just, you know, for you in your own experience. So there's a few seats available here as well. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we have this data in CSV format, and I want to get it into Python somehow, and I'm going to use that first library called pandas. Basically, libraries are like collections of different functions. Um, we're familiar with functions, like if you use Excel, it comes with all these functions, but a library allows other people to create new functions that weren't part of Python to begin with, but you can then use them to do more things, like expand Python. In this case, there's going to be a function that you can use to import a CSV file and turn it into a table. So uh, the function looks like this. Here's how to use it. Pandas, whenever you're using a function that's part of a library, you put the library name. So pandas.read underscore CSV. That's the name of the function, and it's part of the pandas library. This is a function, so it needs parentheses. And then in the parentheses, you put in the name of the file that you want to read. Um, this part, you can put Fred data.csv. Sometimes it will let you autocomplete if you just start with Fred and hit tab. It'll fill it all in. It doesn't work for everyone for some reason, but for some people it works. Um, and this is the part where you need to have this file in this location, because if you don't, you'll get an error. Um, I will misspell this, for, like I'll forget the A. And then this is the error you get when you try to import a file that doesn't exist there. It's long, and at the bottom it says file fred.csv does not exist. So that can happen either because you didn't have the file in the right place, or because you made a typo. If you do it right, you should see a table like this show up. Right? So if you get the error that it's not file doesn't exist, and the error is all the way at the bottom of all that text, make sure the file is there. Um, or make sure you use the spell. And it's possible that the file name changed, right? Yeah. Question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, if there were quite two underscore data CSV files online, CSV, how did you change? It's only looking in the folder that the file, that this notebook file is in. It's not going to be searching your computer. That's why it kind of matters. If it's in a different folder, it's not going to be able to find it. You can tell it specifically to go to other folders, but the easiest thing is to just have it in the same folder. Yeah. Sorry, can you speak up? Yes, so read CSV is part of pandas. Exactly. So if you didn't have pandas, you couldn't use that function. And pandas has a read Excel function, and it has read SQL, and it has all sorts of read functions. But I had to pick one, so I chose CSV. How come you see the functions? Uh, can you see all the different functions available? Uh, there's a lot, so I'm not going to show you right now. So this, what we see here, if you did, you know, if you imported it right, um, is a table. And uh, so let's talk about this data for a second, and then I'll talk more about pandas. Um, this data came from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Uh, website, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. They have the service called FRED. Actually, if you search for it, it's fred.stlouis.org. FRED stands for Federal Reserve Economic uh, Data, I believe. I'm just guessing. Um, and if you go here, you can like, you know, you can go in and you can look for, let's say, unemployment. And then you see all the, the stats, and you can look at the unemployment rate, and then you can download it even as a CSV. Or they have something called an API, which lets you get this data directly into Python. And so what I initially did was I actually ran the API, saved all the data to a CSV using Python, and then 
I made the CSV available to you. Right, so I generated the CSV file using Python in the first place. Um, but you don't need to worry about that. But what we see here are columns for the date. Um, this is DGS 10. Actually, each of these, like if you copy it and just put it in here when you search, you would see what it stands for. This is the 10 year treasury constant maturity. No, that's not it. It is 10 year treasury constant maturity rate. You see how it says DGS 10 next to it in parentheses? And in the URL, DGS 10, for some reason, that's the code they use for the 10 year treasury. Right, so each of those things that we saw, we've got a um, 10 year treasury, one year treasury, this is gold, bullion prices in the US dollar, Dow Jones Industrial Average, NASDAQ, composite, oil, uh, 30 year index, US to EU exchange rate, S&P 500, and the GDP. Now, most of these values are, it says NAN. Why do we think that is? Because it's going back to 1947. So we have data for the GDP going back to 1947 on their website. If you search for the GDP, you'll see it goes back all that far. We don't have most other data going back that far. So when you don't have data in a Python table in pandas, you see NAN, which uh, stands for not a number. It just it means like not applicable. If you scroll down, you'll see that you have data, right? And it starts to actually be filled in, but most of the initial values are empty. And that's what happens actually when you import different data sets. You have data from one day and not for others, it'll fill in with missing values. And there's ways of dealing with missing values using pandas that can be very common, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, the other thing to note is that it automatically adds this index column all the way on the left side. You see how it starts with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. I don't really need that. Sometimes it's useful to have, but in this case, the date, I actually want the date to be my index. Because Pandas has a bunch of really cool functionality for time series data specifically, but that only works if you tell it that the date is the index. So I'm going to specify that. Um, I'm going to change this function a little bit. So inside of read CSV, after the Fred data, there's some optional arguments you can set when you're importing the data. So after this, I'm going to put a comma, and I'm going to say index underscore call equals date. So I can actually specify which column I want to use as my index. I'm going to add a second thing, which is parse underscore dates equals true, and this needs a capital T. So here's, and I'm going to stress this point, and um, you know it's easy to miss, is that little things matter a lot when it comes to code. Uh, capitalization matters, almost always. So when you see I put parse dates equals true, you need a capital T in true. If you put a lowercase t, it's not going to work. Um, you know, these, the quotation marks, the column, the spaces, all of that stuff matters. So, and this is somewhat annoying. Um, you know, once you start coding, you start to, your brain starts to notice little things and you make sure you copy, you know, exactly what you see. But when you first start out, it's very easy for you to not notice, okay, there's a comma there instead of there. So you miss it and your code doesn't work without getting frustrated. So this is one of the reasons why it's hard to do this like live, but yeah, one of the challenges of coding. If you did this right, you can now rerun the cell. So I'm just rerunning the code, but you'll see now that instead of having a, a column added, it's using dates as my index, and the dates are bold. That's essentially what's happening. Um, and I'll show you some of the cool stuff that that allows us to do. It's like built in. You can basically use pandas to say, okay, give me a week over a week. Set of changes, let me look at the last six months, let me look at what they're What did the last argument use? Parse dates. Parse dates equals true. That means you're telling it, uh, if something looks like a date, try to interpret it as a date. You see, even though it starts with a year and then a month and then the day, uh, pandas uh, and Python generally are really good at figuring out what this means. It's going to know that that's the year, the month, and the day, right? It's going to look at the entire column, but in this case, you have to specify that, and it won't do that automatically for some reason. It could have decided to do it automatically. Um, there are, so I mentioned like these are some optional arguments you can set. There's a bunch of them. So how could you see what some of the different options are? If you click anywhere like inside the function or on the function name and you hit, you hold shift and you hit tab twice, shift, tab, tab, what, you'll see this thing pop up. 
and it'll tell you all of the different things you can set. And then if you scroll down, it'll show you some text about each one. And it's basically like an instruction manual for every function. Excel has its version of this. It's fairly well, uh, every function in, in here is fairly well documented. This is a feature of Jupyter Notebook. And so some of the things, for example, you'll see are, you can define what the separator value is. So by default, the separator is a comma, because we're using CSVs. But if you happen to have data that's separated by tabs, or by other characters, you can specify that. Uh, you can tell it if there's a header or not. You know, in, by default, it'll, it'll identify the first row as the header. You can override the names of the columns. You can obviously customize so many different things, and I haven't, I haven't even read through most of this, like ever, but I learn about new things every time where I'm like, oh, I wonder if there's a way to do that. And I look it up and then I realize, yeah, it's not in there. So just so you know, it's anywhere in a function, shift, tab, tab. Or just Google pandas and then the name of the function, like read underscore CSV, and you'll find a page with the documentation that has basically the exact same information. So this is the official like documentation for the pandas library. And it shows you exactly what it is showing you. Yeah. So this is our table. Um, what we want to do is save this into a variable so that we can keep messing around with it. So at the beginning of this line, just add a variable. We'll call it data. And so then you, you just do data equals, put a space in there, just because it's easier to read, and then exactly what you had before. When you rerun this, the table should disappear. And the reason it disappears is because it's in this data variable. If you want to see it again, you can just write data inside of another cell and run it and you'll see the whole table. But usually when you're dealing with a lot of data, you don't, it's not helpful to see everything because it's so much. Uh, we often use data.head with parentheses to take a peek at the first five rows. So this will only show you the first five rows. You can put another number in there, by the way, and you can see the first 10 rows, or the first one row. Just put in a number in between the parentheses. So that's, yes. Is, is that just, do you need data not heavy because you just need data? Yeah, exactly. So now, I, I, so this is a table. This is called a data frame in Panda's language, but it's basically a table. So when you think when you're a data frame, think table. Uh, we put it into a variable. Data. Now we can do, there's a bunch of different functions and things we can do with that variable. Um, and I'll show you a few of them. So head is one of them. Um, tail is another one. If I do data.tail, then I see the last file. And I could have named this anything, right? Yeah. You might have touched on this, but it, when to point everything that we're referencing to the, the CSV file, we put the exact name in. Does that search your entire computer, or is that? No, it only looks in the folder you're currently in. Okay, so wherever the, the root folder that you're currently in. Yeah, wherever this file is. Got it. Exactly. It is possible not to search, but to tell it that the, the data is in a different folder and to sort of navigate it specifically. Um, but it's not going to be. I mean, I'm sure it's possible to tell it to search your computer. I don't know how to do it, and it's probably not best. So you put the, the source data and the Python file in the same place? In the same place, exactly. Sometimes I create a data folder and I just put it in there. Uh, okay, so here, tail, head. Um, this is one way of looking at the data. Another is if you do data.plot with parentheses, this is how you start plotting. So this is a, a function that you know, comes included with pandas and has a lot of customization. This is just the default. We're plotting all of the different columns as a line graph, and you'll see that your x-axis is the date, and it's already breaking it out by year, because it understands how dates work. Um, and again, it's just data.plot. If I didn't add that matplotlib in line, I wouldn't see this. So that's what that little percent sign matplotlib in line is. Um, this is not exactly the easiest thing to understand, because obviously, you know, Dow Jones Industrial Average is the biggest, the rest is hard. So one thing you can do here, you know, if you hit shift, tab, tab, you'll see the different options. You can specify a y and an x-axis. So I can say that I only want to plot y equals, and then dgs10, and that will just plot my one column. That should be 10 years treasury. Yeah. 
So you imported a whole bunch of libraries. What if and you seem to be applying a function called plot? Yeah. What if three libraries had a thing called plot? How, how would it know which, which one to use? use? So it knows to use the pandas function because when we first read the CSV, we were we did pandas.readcsv, and then we set that equal to data. What that's doing is it's creating something called a data frame, which is a table. That the construct, the idea of a table in Python is specifically defined by this pandas library. So it says you can import a CSV, create a table, data frame, and it defines all these functions that you can run on data. So every single data dot is part of, uh, is part of pandas. So when you do data.plot. But you said that that plot is actually coming from the, from the MATLAB. It's not. It's coming from pandas, but that matplotlib in line is what's allowing this to be displayed inside of Jupyter Notebook. So it's, think of that second line as more like a setting, like turn on inline graphing. Yeah, but that's a reasonable question. Um, so this is, you know, we're plotting just one thing. And you could, of course, go through and do this for every single column, or you can do the Python way to do it. Which is looping over all the columns and just you know saying plot. So I'll show you how to do a for loop to do this uh, inside of this cell. So there is um, I can do data dot columns. This one does not have parentheses, and this shows you a list of all the columns. Now I can loop over this just so you know, so you know you can get a list of all the columns. This is also you can override the names of the columns through this. You can say data dot columns equals and then put in a list and it'll just replace the column names. But I can do a loop. So the loop would look like this. Four columns in data.columns colon. This is a basic for loop. And essentially what it's saying is go through all the columns and do something. And we're about to tell it what to do. You hit enter, you should see it tabbed in. If it's not tabbed in, you forgot the colon at the end of the line. Now I can say data.plot, same as I did before, but now I can say y equals column. So you see here, I said four, oh, I made a typo. This won't work. It should say four column in data.columns. A single column, and then data.plot y equals column. So basically what I'm saying is for every column in this, in all the columns, just plot it. If you run this, you'll see that a chart is generated for every single one of these. I'm going to show you the code. looks like that. This is a basic for loop. And if you go into the Python basics, I show you how this works generally. But it's kind of like a way of uh, saying, you know, copy paste a lot, like apply all. I have data.plot, which I did before, but I'm applying it to all the columns. And it's you know, one example of how you can automate something that a human can do. But uh, yes. If you want to change the format of the graph in, it makes sure that, that every other plot that you do uses that. It's absolutely possible. I'm not going to get too much into formatting, but I'm going to show you a few different graphing options, and I'll, I'll show you some of my favorites. But there's so much you can do here. I mean, uh, everything is customizable from the colors of the lines to where the legend is to you know what kind of plot you're using. I'll show you some of my favorite plots. Uh, that'll come next. Uh, but just to get a brief overview, like some of these look weird, obviously. Like, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, DGS30 has this big gap in it. If you go to the Fred data set, you will see there's actually a gap in the data. So this is not a our problem on our end. This is a problem on the Fred end. Um, the GDP is a funny one. So what's actually going on here is we have data in these points, but we only have them at discrete moments in time. And they're so small, they don't even show up. So um, you know, it's just something to realize. Python has a way of uh, of averaging it out, smoothing it all out for you. So it'll it'll look at both data points and it'll fill in all the empty values with an average. I'm not going to show you how to deal with empty data sets right now, um, but I just wanted to go over that. Um, let's let me show you some of my favorite plots. Um, so these are the default plots, but remember we imported a library called Seaborn, which does some statistical kind of plotting. Seaborn is really cool. So here's something you can do. Seaborn uh, dot plot, and then just pass in the data. This one is different, right? So it's not data dot plot. This is part of the Seaborn library. Seaborn dot plot data. If you run this, 
uh, it'll take a while. You'll see that there's this asterisk. You'll get a warning. That's fine, actually. I'll, uh, I can explain a little bit about why, why it's not happening. And then eventually, you'll see why this takes a while. Okay, so it's going through every single column and it's generating what's called a pair, uh, I think it's called a pairwise scatter plot. So along the left axis, you have all the columns. Along the bottom, you have all the columns. And then each of these scatter plots is the relationship between that column on the bottom and the column on the left. It's hard to read, right? Because there's so much. Can you explain that again? Yes. Okay, so here I'm going to go through. This is DGS 10. This is 10 year treasury. DGS 1 is 1 year treasury, gold, etc. Everyone above is the scatter plot between the 10 year treasury and then whatever's on the left side. So this is GDP. This is the scatter plot relationship between the 10 year treasury and the GDP. This says SP 500. So this is the relationship between the 10 year treasury on the x axis and the SP 500 on the y axis. What you'll notice is along the diagonal, you see you have a histogram. That's because that's where the column intersects with itself. So rather than, I mean, it can't show you the relationship between itself. So you have the frequency, the histogram of what that data looks like. And it's actually flipped. It's like mirror on, on both sides of this. The cool thing about this, if we can read it, obviously, because there's so many columns here, it's hard to read, um, is you can get a very high level overview of the relationship between all your variables, all of your columns. Pretty cool, right? Um, so this is just a good starting point. Right. Uh, the warning real quick, this happens when you have some columns with empty values. Specifically, uh, our GDP column has a bunch of empty values, and a bunch of the other columns have empty values as well. And it's just a, it's a warning that happens when it tries to run some of these things on empty values. It still works though. So it's, you know, a lot of times you can just safely ignore them. It is possible to layer regression on this. I'm not going to show you how to do it because it takes way longer. And if you were going to do that, you might want to do it on a subset of like, let's say, three columns or something like that. And then you'll see. Uh, the other nice thing about every one of these graphs, by the way, is their images. So if you click on any one of them and you drag, you'll see it's an image. You can save it as a PNG file, like this. That's this file. You can put it inside of like a PowerPoint. Or uh, let's see if this works with this. If I take the entire pair plot, Now I have this whole thing, and that might make it easier for me to like expand, right? Look at all the data. So this maybe right, is easier. Or you can just uh, right click on it and click save in the chest. So again, seaborn.hairplot, and you just pass in the entire table that we pulled in. So this is like just two lines of code. Um, okay, there's other cool stuff. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you just between any two. Um, Seaborn dot joint plot. So it's like a pair plot, but just between two things. I'm gonna take the x-axis and say that this is the S&P 500. And I'm gonna set the y-axis to Dow Jones Industrial Average. I'm just picking any two columns. And then I have to pass in my data, and I'm gonna say data equals data. And that's because this is how Seaborn works. I'm telling it the columns, but it doesn't know from any of this is the library and this is the function. I need to give it the data as well. So that's how I pass in the data. I can do this in any word, by the way. If you run this, you get another warning. Yeah, don't so worry about that. And then you get the specific pair plot of those two, as well as like a nice sort of frequency distribution along both sides. I'll go back up. Um, one other argument you can add in here is if you do at the end comma kind equals in quotation marks reg, it will add a linear regression on top of it. It actually adds a confidence interval as well, but because the relationship here is so uh, like linear, we don't really see anything. So th this looks like this. A lot of arguments: x-axis, y-axis, data, and then kind equals. Reg, and that's a linear regression. You have a question, or do you just want to answer? What does the kind mean? Uh, there's different there's different kinds of, of statistical models you can run on top. So this is so let's see shift tab tab kind. Um, see by default it was just scatter. If we scroll down to kind, 
we will see the different options. Scatter, reg, resid, kde, or hex. I've never done most of those, so I'm not sure. So that kind of function, how do you do a regression? Same thing as you wrote data equal data. It's like, what do you do with the data? So what's hap yeah, well, no, so what's happening is the function is called joint plot. This is part of the Seaborn library. And these are all function arguments. These are, uh, in some cases, there are options that I'm setting on this function. That's the kind equals regression. Data equals data is I'm actually passing in the data for it to run the function. So that one, the first three are required in this case. The last one was on me. Hmm? Can you set this equal to something else? Can you set something like your name equals this thing so that... Set what equal? It's called expression. Uh, yeah, but I'm not sure what, if you can do anything with it to set it equal. Because you might be able to extract the information out of it, right? Because this, uh, has, this, has, this has more information. Than it does, it. yeah. It does, however, you cannot extract the actual regression information. Interestingly enough, the guy who invented Seaborn has no interest in making any of that available to people. He said, if you want to do that, use the stats model library, which I'll show you. So even though you can see the regression, he doesn't want to let you use Seaborn to be able to actually get the like, R squared or the, or the slope or any of that. It's there, but the guy who decided. Um, what else? Okay, I'm going to show you maybe my coolest feature, my favorite feature. Um, going back to the data table. Uh, if you do dot .corr parentheses, you get this table of correlations between all of the different columns. It's kind of like the pairwise regression that we did, but this is just, you know, instead of a scatter plot, it's just straightforward correlation. This is still kind of hard to see, right? I mean, you can look at it and you can see, obviously, each column is correlated with itself. It's kind of flipped a little bit. So I'm going to show you, you can pass this into a heat map. Seaborn lets you do a heat map. Yeah, it's exactly right. So uh, it looks like this. Seaborn dot heat map, that's the third function, and then in here I'm just doing data dot corr, so the same thing I had before. So I'm passing that in, this is what it looks like by default. Right, so it's useful, but it's not super useful, but I'm going to show you how you can do some formatting to it. Right, but you see here correlation, and then this is like the color. Uh, one thing you probably, I mean, I'm not going to do too much about formatting, but if you do cmap equals blues, that stands for color map. There's a lot of colored mapping options. You can customize. There's probably dozens, hundreds of these. I like blue. Um, let's add anote, A-N-N-O-T equals true. What that does is it layers the actual number on top of it. So that makes it obviously a little more useful to you. And I guess I could leave it there. Um, if you were a little more concerned, like let's say I would just want to round this to one decimal point. I figured out how to do this like two days ago. Uh, you add FMT equals, and then in, print, in quotation marks, dot one F. Now I have one decimal point. That just stands for like point one F means float in Python, which is like Python and the computer science way of saying it. So now I have, you know, Something maybe close to something I could just put directly into like a PowerPoint file or send to someone. You can customize this, I can get rid of the thing on the side. There's all sorts of things you can do, but that's sort of where I'm going to leave it. But if you do want to learn more, if you just looked up Seaborn heat map, you're going to see the documentation for Seaborn. There's a whole website showing you all the different options and then a bunch of example code. So this is the default. But then here is where I set the minimum and maximum values. Here's, you know, setting a different center. All different ways of customizing, right? This one shows you annotation equals true. You can add lines. Yeah. It's one way to visualize it. Cool, right? Okay. Uh, next I'm going to show you now. So we have all this sort of background data. We're going to get stock price. Stock prices for a particular stock. I'm going to get Exxon Mobil stock prices. We're going to correlate it against some of this data. Let's see what the relationship is. Um, so we're sort of done exploring the data we've imported from CSV. 
The next data we're not going to get from the CSV, we're going to get it from an API. So I'm going to just demarcate this by creating another markdown cell and saying you know, this is going to be for getting stock data from an API. Normally, I would actually have a bunch of text at each point along the way saying here's what I'm doing, here's what I've learned, etc. Uh, again, just switch to markdown before you do this, and one one hashtag and a space is just the biggest header. And then shift enter and you run it. Uh, this will also make it easier when I send this out later for you to scan through and see the different parts. Um, okay, so let's talk about an API really quick. Um, so you may have heard of the term API before, but you don't know what it is. It stands for Application Programming Interface, but you, that doesn't matter. There's no need to remember it. Um, it's basically a way for you to write code that interacts with like a third party service. So before I explained to you the different parts of a web application where you have the database, the rules, and the web pages, the web pages part is only for your convenience as a human, because if, if it just showed you a bunch of text, it'd be very difficult for you to understand. But computers don't care about the visualization. In fact, the visualization stuff gets in the way. So if you take out the first part, if you take out the web pages, you basically have an API. An API is just the rules in the database, and then this, instead of web pages, you get back just text. But text is fine for computers. Specifically, you get back something called JSON. Um, it stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's kind of the standard, um, and it's non-language specific. So there's a way of getting back, taking this and importing it to Python, or PHP, or Ruby, or whatever you want to do. And that's why every API can be accessed by any language that you're using. Um, and so essentially, you know, an API is like a database with instructions for how you can get data out of the database using code. Um, here's what I mentioned. It, this is basically something called a dictionary in Python, which if you go through the basics of a Python file, you'll learn about dictionaries. It's just like uh, labels and values. So here you have name, Exxon Mobile, ticker, XOM, that sort of thing, and that helps you understand what the data is. But uh, we could spend you know, a long time talking about APIs, and I just sort of want to explain the basics of it. Uh, the net of it is that you can use APIs to do cool things with Python. Uh, for example, stuff you can do with an API, you can get data like stock prices or the weather. You can, there's weather APIs for getting live weather, historical weather. You can actually make trades using APIs. Right? So not just getting data, but doing things. Uh, you can send texts, make phone calls using APIs. You can do quantum computing using an API now. IBM has a quantum computing API. Um, you can do image recognition. But you know, there's, there's kind of the sky's the limit. Um, and there's many APIs for getting stock prices. There's one called Quandle, Alpha Advantage, Google Finance used to have an API, but they shut it down recently. And then there's IEX Finance, which is the one that we use. Um, again, this, if we, we actually installed this above, so we're going to, we should be good. Uh, so here's how you can actually, I mentioned, I'm going to show you the Python package index. When you install something using that pip install command, what it does is it goes to this website. This is built by Python, and if you search for something like IAX Finance, you'll see it in here. Everyone who writes code uploads it here, and so when you install it, this is where Python knows to go to install it on your computer. You theoretically could just download this and put it on your computer manually, but the whole pit install thing does it for you. It's a lot more convenient. So just so you know what's going on in the background. Um, yes? Okay, basic question about APIs. Like mm -hmm. if we're, you, you mentioned a few cases <coughs> or scenarios where there are APIs available. Where should we go for thinking of an idea and we want to know that is there an API available and then also, mm -hmm. Like, do most websites have it, or what's like, what is the kind of? I don't know, I mean, of the first thing I do is I look up Python stock price API on Google, and then I'm going to find okay Google Finance, and I'm going to find you know this Quora page for which Python libraries can I use to access stock market data in real time, and I'll find a bunch of answers, and um, so you kind of do a bit of the research. So mm -hmm. Alpha Advantage, that's one of them. Um, yeah, does that work? Yeah, I mean that's essentially what I do. I don't. There's there are websites that sort of you know put together the top packages for different things. You can browse those, but they're not one that I go to by default. I will say, and a lot of these I'm learning about over time. So I was using Google Finance, and then when that broke, I was like, 
Shit, what do I do now? I'm going to die next time. What about probabilities of uh, uh, some malicious software in the API? It's such a good question, right? But the funny thing is we never think about it until I show you how it's actually done. We're working with APIs every single day, dozens of times a day, and we are potentially opening ourselves up to the risk of someone writing malicious code without thinking about it. Now that you actually know how it's working, you know, it starts to raise some questions. And the answer is, yeah, it's totally possible for someone to upload a library that does something you don't intend it to. And that's always the risk when you're working with open source and code that other people write. So how do you deal with that? I mean, one thing is uh, you can do a lot of research to figure out what are the different packages people use, see what the most popular ones are, you know, there's general social proof that you know if thousands of people use something, then it's somewhat vetted, maybe. You can see the company behind it. Uh, or you can say, we're not working with APIs as a rule. And some companies do that, but I would say that that kind of protectionist attitude, uh, it's not really feasible anymore these days. Because a company that tries to do everything themselves is a company that never really does anything. Because why would you build your own you know, email newsletter service when you can use MailChimp and they have an API for doing that, right? So, yeah, or you can look through the code itself, but, you know, you might not know enough about it to know what to look like. So at larger companies, you know, this is what some of the, the teams do is they, like, vet libraries like this to figure out, you know, what can you use. Um, okay, so here's how you get data. Uh, IEXfinance.stocks. We actually imported this up top. Dot get underscore historical underscore data. And then we can pass in any stock ticker. Uh, I'll do XOM for XOM mobile. Here's what it shows by default. It's kind of messy. I'm going to show you. you know, we're not going to use this exactly. But first run this and make sure it works. This is a function called get historical data that's part of this library. And essentially what it's doing is it's they build this this package for interacting with their own API. So they made functions to make it easy for you to interact with the API without having to do it manually yourself. Um, if you got this, go and add a second argument here, which is output underscore format equals pandas. Uh, that didn't work. I misspelled output format. O-U-T, quick format. Now it will show up as a, as a pandas data frame slash a table. Right? Before, what I had was actually a Python thing called a dictionary. Now I have it as a table, but I had to specify that. But that's how I wanted to see it. So this is actually two different libraries kind of working together a little bit. So I've got this table. Uh, what do I actually have? And dates, open prices, high, low, close, and volume. For example, right? So um, we want to now. I mean, the goal is going to be we want to merge this with our other table so that we have them both in one place, and then we can run a regression across any two columns. Any questions so far on this? So we have to make sure it's working for them. Yes. The IE finance troubleshoot, like. We get through it. You mentioned that some people cannot. Get if you can't install it, you won't be able to do this for us. So you'll have to either do it at home on your own, or you know, because yeah. this is this relies on the internet now. First of all, so you have to have this wouldn't work if I was not on Wi-Fi, and if I don't have the the package installed, it won't work. Um, so let's create a variable for this so that we can then merge the two variables. I'll call this xom underscore data. So I have my data variable, I have my xom data variable. Uh, remember, this again is just another table, so I can do xom data dot head. Same thing I did before with just data. And all of the other functions that I did before on data would work on this as well, because this is just another table. And again, we could call this in. So just run that. Yeah, sorry. Once it gets really long. 
You know, it's hard to see it, right? I'm going to wait until uh, people are a little confused. Huh? So, so what's the difference between these one and the one before? They're two totally separate. They're both tables. They're both uh, a pandas language. They're called data frames. But they're two. They're separate. They're different variables. We'll, we'll merge them together into one table in the next step. But for right now, they're you know, totally separate data. It's like two different worksheets in Excel. No, but what I mean is the one. The first one, you didn't use the XOM data? Yeah, that's a variable. We can name it anything we want. Oh, okay, so all right. Yeah, we made that up. It's somewhat descriptive, because we already have data. We could have called this data too, if we wanted to. Maybe that would have been, you know, maybe if I called this data too, it's just more intuitive. Huh? The difference between API and database. Same thing. I mean, not exactly, but an API lets you access information in the database. But on its own, a database, it can be hard to get out of the data, unless there's an API around it. Yep. Yes? What the XOM means? You made it up. It doesn't matter. I, here, I'll call this data2, oh, okay. if that's clear. XOM is Exxon Mobile stock ticker. That's why I chose that. So now we have data and we have data two. Yes. You said this was uh, because you had Wi Fi and you had the uh, files up, uh, pulled in and you are using Jupyter right now. Yeah. So, in any other environment, could you use another uh, notepad with which you have the uh, right data access and internet? Is this just one of the tools that we could use to run Python or is there? Yeah, yeah, you can do this. Uh, there's many ways of writing Python code. So you, you can take the same code uh, and run it in any other place you can run Python. It will also. As long as we have the files and the access to the web. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. The formula for data and data two are the same. The formula? Yeah, the, the, I couldn't see the data one is EEX finance is the same as XP. No, data, the original, we got from importing the CSV. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did that at the beginning when we ran the read CSV file. Okay. So they come from different places, but they're both tables. Okay. Yeah. This table came from an API. Okay, so now let's merge them together. So we have data one and data two, and I'm going to create a little markdown thing for merging the data. Um, and there's a, actually a bunch of ways you can merge data, but the easiest is data. This is the first table we have. Dot merge. And then data two, that's the second table. And then I tell it what to use to merge it on. So I'm going to tell it merge the two on the date column. Uh, this only works because they both have a column called date. If they have different columns, I can specify which one to use from each side. So there's another argument that's like left on and right on, and I can put separate values. But if they have the same one, I can just say on whatever. And if you run this, this is what it looks like. Data.merge, that's the first data set. Data2 is the second data set. And I'm saying what column to merge them on. Yes? Can you like go back and forth between Excel and Python just working different things? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, but one thing to notice is once you import this into Pandas, um, anything you do in here won't affect the CSV. So if you want to save the changes, there's a function dot to CSV, and you can save the results to a CSV file. So you can pull things in, do a bunch of stuff, and then like export it out. This is the process. Yes. So if one of your tables has daily date uh, frequency, the other one has monthly. Mm. Is it doing an inner join? Is it doing a left join? So, good question, but that only makes sense if you know SQL. By default, this is doing what's called an inner join, which means it's throwing out values that one of them has that the other one doesn't have. So notice, the start date here is 2015. We basically lost all the GDP data from before 2015. Um, that might not be ideal, and it's possible to override to say, no, I want to keep both sets, and then I want to manually deal with missing values. 
filling it in or doing whatever. So you, you wouldn't normally want to do that because you wouldn't want to throw away good data, but we would have to do a bunch of stuff like making sure the dates and stuff were aligned for the linear regression. So I'm just going to skip over that and doing it this kind of merge is the easiest way around. So, and those are, those are all arguments here. Remember, you can do shift, tab, tab, and you'll see how it equals in on, left on, right on, etc. all that sort of stuff. So this is the join set. So you can see here, Dave, we have all the things, and then all the way on the right, we also have the open, high, low, close, and volume columns. And they've been merged on the date. Um, we need to now save this somewhere. Right, because we did this merge, but it, it, we haven't actually saved the result anywhere. So I'm going to actually override the initial data table with this merge thing. Okay, so I'm saying data equals data dot merge. <laughs> this is called recursive, which means you can override a variable with itself after you do something to it, uh, and you know you can do that with Python. It's fine. Um, <coughs> Don't run this again, though, because then you'll keep just adding columns to it, and that's unnecessary. Yeah? Yeah, I was gonna say, so, yeah that's what I was going to ask. Like you, what happens? Right, like now you can make changes to this you know, previous CSV and like, kind of just rerun this, right? Because yeah. then it would be circular. Exactly. So, or you make the changes, just run the entire file, kernel, restart, and run all, and it'll go from the top. Yeah. What if you make a mistake and you want to go back? Uh, the easiest thing is to go back, change it, and then do kernel, restart, and run all. Just start from the beginning. Because as long as logically the code progresses and you haven't deleted anything, um, it'll just go one by one. Yes? Um, so were you saying that if I want to go to my uh, CSV Excel and for some reason I'll change the data, including the underline that I'm using, I can do that. I use them pull that data automatically, just do like, was it F9 on it? Uh, so if you want to change the CSV file, yeah. like I can go in and I can make whatever changes I want, and then I open this up and I just click restart and run all. Because what's going to happen is it's going to start up at the top, go all the way down, and then here where it reads the CSV file, it's going to now read the updated CSV file. And so you can now sort of do the same process times. as many times as you want. Exactly. So you can yeah you can build out a process and then run this every week for a long time. Uh, also you know you can do data dot two CSV and go from one file to another and keep doing convert. Um, but now that we have all of this in one data frame, so if I do data dot head, now I'll see all of the columns in there. Again, I, we lost data. I'm okay with that over time. Okay, so now we want to run a uh, regression, but there's one, there's an additional step we want to do. So we don't just want to run regressions on prices, we want to run regressions on the returns. So daily returns. Here we have the price, how do we calculate daily, daily returns? Let me just create a section for calculating daily returns. Um, pretty easy function for this. Data.pct percent change. Uh, so what that does is it just goes through the entire table and it creates a new table which has essentially the percent change of the, each value from the value before. So you notice the whole first row is empty because there's no percent change in the first row from the one before. There is no row before. But every other one, this is basically percent change. It doesn't look like percent, but it is. Um, so here you have like, you know, 10-year treasury went down uh, 3.8%, I guess. How did you, because I think you deleted some years. When I merged it, it only kept rows uh, that were in both tables. So it automatically threw, the, the, um, the, the Exxon Mobil data set starts in 2015. So when I merged them together, it threw away everything from before that from the other column. So here's my percent change, right? Um, I'm going to show you a little trick for removing the first row in Python, because we don't need it. If you put, after this percent change, after the commas, put square brackets, one, and then colon, like this, and then run it, 
that throws out the first row. Essentially what you're doing is when you put square brackets, you can put any two numbers. So I could say give me back you know, rows one through five, for example. If I don't fill in the last one, I'm saying give me back, um, it's not row one though. Python starts at zero. So that's why one is the second row. In fact, most programming languages start at zero, which is one of those annoying things that you just end up getting used to. So if I put zero, it would give me back everything. But one colon is, say, start at row two and give me everything after that. So um, I'm going to now save this into another variable. We'll call this returns. Yes? Is it quick to put it in percentage format? Yes, yeah, let me see if I can remember. Returns.style.format.2. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm, let me try this first. No, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's something like this, but I always have to look it up maybe before I. You can customize the format of everything inside of Python, but yeah. it's always kind of hard for me to remember this one. And you can customize every row or just apply something to the entire thing. Here, let's see if we can hear it. Pandas format percentage. Oh, I remember. I know what it is. Style the format colon dot to percentage. Drag the colon. Right, so this did it to the entire thing, but I could have specified individual columns and saved it and do whatever. This actually doesn't apply the, the settings, by the way. This only shows it to you, but I'd have to override, I'd have to say returns equals and override it if I wanted to see it. But you can see here, I'm basically applying a formatting to the entire thing. And including it in the end. So this is the percentage, but I'm showing that to you, but um, don't worry too much about it. Okay. Is the first column also zero from a formatting perspective? It just how we re we remove the first row, but oh, it's actually row. Yeah, yeah. So the first column, column is also zero. zero. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, it all starts with zero. Um, okay, so we have now another table. So we have our initial table, table with the data, we created a new table with the percent return, <coughs> right? Uh, returns on head, so you just the top. Cool. Now we have what we want to run a linear regression. You ready? For like the ultimate point of like where you're trying to get. Create another section. Linear regressions. Okay, so we're using the stats models library. Uh, Statsmodels.org. This is a statistical library in Python. You look it up and you go to let's say examples. You see all the different kinds of regressions available. Ordinary least squares, generalized least squares, quantile, etc. You can do many, even plotting. I don't know, I've never done plotting. But a bunch of different options. Um, there's a, this is a pretty popular library. There's another one that's more popular for machine learning, but they are actually very similar in terms of how they So I'm going to show you how to use this. You can apply the same concept to the other library. That's called scikit learn. Um, but let's do it. Um, and in fact, if you clicked on any one of these, it would actually show you how to run the code and what you get. And I, this is how I figured out how to do what I'm about to show you by just reading through the website. <coughs> so the first thing you do is you pull out the x axis. Usually, when you're doing a regression, for some reason, it's capital X. So x equals returns colon, and then in here, SP500. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to pull out only one of the columns from the table. So here I'm saving that one column to x, and then below I'm just showing you what's inside of x. It keeps the uh, index, by the way, and then this is the value of just that S&P 500 column. Because the whole point of a regression is we want to pick two columns and run our regression on them. Yeah. Good question. Um, 
Capital X in this case is a variable, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. It's just a weird convention in the data yeah. science community. Like, if you go into here, you'll see they do capital X lowercase y. But I could call this lowercase x. But then you essentially, you're just putting the variable and it's printing it out for you. Shouldn't you be saying print and then print? Uh, in the cool, one of the cool things about Jupyter Notebook is you don't actually have to explicitly write print. If you just put a variable and we run it, it'll show you what's in that variable. We save stuff. So if, I, if we to use an earlier example, we just put the word data instead of like if we want everything, like instead of data dot we just put data. It would have. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just showing you what X looks like now. Um, we have to do something though, which is uh, I'm now overriding X with something. Uh, X stats models dot API dot add underscore constant and then pass in X. I'll show you what this does. It's just it's it's a specific line that stats models makes you do if you want to run a linear regression. Um, and it has to do with how linear regressions work, and this is something I just learned recently. So, I don't know, it's interesting. We do a very short prior. The whole idea of a linear regression is like, let's say you have a scatter plot of like a bunch of different data points. You want to come up with a line that goes through and it fits it accurately. The formula for a line is like y equals, we call it a plus b x. The idea being for every x here, you want to figure out what the y is. So you have this is like this is the y-intercept, so this is just a, and then the b is the slope. So a linear regression means figuring out a and b for the best line, right? Um, if you don't add a row of ones, you're not going to get a because this is the same as saying like a one plus bx. So the one just the row of constant ones is what allows it to figure out what the constant thing is and this. If you didn't add the constant, you would always end up with a line that goes through zero, and that's just not always going to be the best line. That's as far as I understand about this. I'm not an expert in statistics, so, so in case people are curious. Um, the next thing is we need to grab the y. So y. Y, we're going to do y equals returns. Uh, this is the close price. I'm doing all this in one cell. Um, the annoying thing about close is it's not, uh, it's not, it doesn't really describe what it is. So I'm actually going to just add rename XLM there. The nice thing there is now we're going to rename it in our model so we actually know what it is instead of just close. So you can always rename a specific column. By doing something like that. Okay, so we basically, um, I'm gonna get rid of the cell below. Just the end. So we pulled our x, we pulled our y. Here's how you run a regression. Um, we first define the model. Model equals, and now I'm gonna grab from the stats models dot library, so stats models dot API dot OLS, that's the ordinary least squared model. There's a bunch of other options I showed you. And then in here, we're passing y and x. Those are the two variables. This is just how they do it. I don't know why they put y first and x second. Can't really answer that for you. So this is how you create the model. Can I ask? Can you repeat what OLS is in it? It's a kind of regression called an ordinary least squares regression. That's as much as I can say. Is there a reason you use lowercase y? And... No. Okay. Because that's how they do it when they show, it, show me how to do it. Okay. And it's how everyone who I've ever seen run a model does it. Okay. This is just a convention. But you can use uppercase and lowercase to both. So we create the model. There's two additional steps. Um, we have to get the results of doing model.fit. So, when you're doing a regression, usually creating the model and fitting the model are two different steps. And there's a few reasons for that. Often you create the model and you do a few things before you fit the model or you 
customize it, and you can try it on a few different options. But you just should know that it takes two steps. This is how you get the results. And then we can do results.summary with parentheses. And now we can see the results, and that's what you'll get. And there's more data, but I'm going to leave this up. <coughs> it's a lot. Can you explain again why you did the model fit? Because it told me to. That's the simplest oh. explanation. Because when I read about it, that's what it said to do. You know, like, people ask this question, I do it, and then I ask, why do I have to do it that way? And then I can come up with an answer, usually. Um, and I think the reason why is when you run a regression, often there's different, multiple steps you take. And sometimes you create a model, you do things to it, and then you fit the model. So it makes sense to split them. But beyond that, I'm not really sure. Excuse me? Yes. Um, what's the benefit of doing this in Excel, or of doing this here, not in Excel? And if you wanted to change the stock now, would you have to redo everything? No, you can just update what's in there and run shit better. Right? Like, oh, change the stock? Yeah, you can just go up and change XOM to something else and then run from the top and you would update it again. Um, I mean, one benefit here so, like, first of all, look at all the data you're running. <coughs> Really quickly. R squared, adjusted R squared, F stat. Here's our uh, constant, um, the coefficient for both. So what are we getting? Our R squared is 0 0.418. So it's actually not that good of an R squared. However, if you look at the probability, the p-value, it's very low. It means this is a statistically significant relationship. Um, here's the coefficients. S&P is 0.9. It's pretty highly uh, correlated, and the p-value of that is zero, which means that it's very statistically significant that S&P 500 uh, value affects the value of Exxon Mobil stock price. This kind of thing, like you can only get this in uh, Python, something like R, or you can calculate every one of these things manually in Excel if you wanted to. Like you're totally free to keep doing this manually if you know how to. But so maybe up until this point. You can do it all in Excel. I'll show you how to do a multi-factor regression, which might be harder to do in Excel. So this is just the overall summary. Um, yeah. Related to the previous question, can you actually pick up any of these numbers out of this thing? Or yeah. So I have the results. Um, if I do results dot r squared, uh, that's the r squared. Actually, if you do results dot and then hit tab, you'll see all the different options of things you can get out of this. So just results dot and then tab. Yeah, auto company doesn't always work in the program. Is there a setup that you turn on and off? No, just kind of set up the default. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and if I wanted to, I can visualize this again with Seaborn. I have a Seaborn joint plot, and I can just pass each one individually. This would be 500. Uh, y equals close. Theta equals returns. I have a new table now, remember? And kind equals regression. I'm just doing what I did before. And then this is essentially the, this is the linear regression. It's the same, um, it's the formula I did before for creating a response. I'm just putting in two different columns. Yes. Uh, when we said close before, that, that's just referencing the, the column in the XLM. Yeah. And so it just knows that, I guess. It just automatically looks for that top header row. Yeah. Yeah, you, you put in the name of the header. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you is so this is called a, a I guess single factor regression. We're just you know using one variable. Just if you copy this whole thing and we'll do it again below, but I'll show you how to do a multi factor regression. Because it's almost the same thing. Copy this whole thing. So we're looking now, this is the relationship between 
uh, XM Mobile and S and P five hundred. But I want to see if I add in the you know Dow Jones Industrial Average, how does that affect the linear relation? How does that change the R squared? What are the coefficients, etc. So let me copy it and paste it below. It's the same thing. Uh, but instead of grabbing one column here, I can grab two columns. So you get rid of that. You need two sets of square brackets to grab two because we're putting in a list now. So it's SP500. Oh, I'll do a NASDAQ com. So this is how you would grab two columns. Just be mindful two sets of square brackets in there because it's a list inside of square brackets. Like that. But if you run this now, you're going to get essentially another regression, but with uh, two factors. So here's something, for example, you can do with Python, you wouldn't really roll it yourself. I can go through all of the different columns, and I can create unique sets of three values. Right? So I can take S&P, gold, and GDP. I can take all the different possible sets using Python, just iterate. And I can run all of them through a model like this, and then I can rank them by R squared and see which three factors have the highest uh, effect, so that I know, you know, Exxon Mobil stock price is the is the most sensitive to the movement of oil, uh, you know, the U.S. GDP and S&P 500, but it's the least sensitive to, let's say, ten-year, thirty-year treasuries or something. I mean, that's something it would just take forever to do in Excel, so we uh, So this is now the multi-factor regression, and this is kind of an interesting one, um, because you have a slightly higher R-squared, right? 0.51, so that's a little better. But now go down here. Uh, coefficient of S&P, this is 2.2, and NASDAQ is minus 1.1. They both have a very low p-value, meaning they're both statistically significant, but they essentially cancel each other out, right? If you Take the 2.2, you subtract the minus 1.1. It's basically the same that I had before, which is a coefficient of around 1. And that's because these two columns are very highly correlated, S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So when you run a linear multi-factor regression and two of your variables are like correlation of 1, uh, they basically cancel each other out. It, it, you're not adding much, and in fact, you kind of are screwing with the model a little bit. So typically, before you do this, you look at the correlations and you remove ones that are highly correlated. Yeah. What did you say before about that you can only do this here and not in Excel? So something you can only do in Python and not Excel? But you, just, you, you just said it before. But that you were, you were. So I was saying you can generate all possible combinations of variables and then run a linear regression on every single one of them to see which variables have the highest effect on like, the stock price. Because there could be thousands of possible combinations, right? And if you were doing this in Excel, you'd have to manually create all the combinations and run a regression for each one. And I thought you could do that in 0.2 seconds. Um, okay, that's as far as I want to go with this example. Okay? Because I have another example prepared. And we can, it's, it's cool and it's not as statistically heavy as it sounds. Do we want to go there? All right. So this is about textual analysis. So we close this down. Save it. Close it. Make this available to everyone. Close this down. I'm going to go back and I'm going to create a new file. The same steps I did before. New Python 3. I was not listening. Uh, let's call this one what do we have? five text analysis with Python. Just rename it. Um, initially, what I did here was I was going to use a web scraper to go scrape uh, an article and then have us use a natural language processing tool to parse it. And then I found a library that does that for us. So I'm just going to show us how to use the library, but it's quite. So this is called, it's called Newspaper 3K. And it allows you to basically deal with uh, articles that are online and parse them and do analysis of like sentiment of the articles, what are the keywords, what are they about, all this really cool stuff, but inside of Python. So in order to run this, we're going to have to pip, oops, pip install 
newspaper 3K. Like that. So that's going to go and install this, this, uh, this tool. And this is what it looks like when you know, install something in the water. Oh, yeah. It takes a little while. I'm going to add a little row above. By the way, if you want to add a row above something, if you click on the left hand side so it shows up blue, you click the A key, it'll add itself above, which is part of the intro to the Python file. Or intro to the pen file. So let me just create a title here Text analysis with Python. Mm -hmm. And this is a I'm going to show you kind of a preview of what's being covered in the next seminar in terms of natural language processing, so you can get a sense of how it works. Um, okay. It looks like everything was installed. The last line here is successfully installed, and then it gives you a list. It installs a bunch of them because Newspaper 3K actually relies on a bunch of other packages, and that's and it knows to go and install all of those. All right. So here's how this one works. Um, I'm going to go to VentureBeat because I tried this with like New York Times and Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal has a paywall, so it actually won't let us create it. New York Times is a little weird with it, it doesn't grab the whole article, but it generally works. But if you did like a VentureBeat or TechCrunch or Business Insider or, or any other new site, uh, this works. I'm just going to pick a random one, but it's interesting. And another one interesting. Okay, Kaban founder Kevin Chu is blockchain will revolutionize game economics. You can literally pick anything. So if you want to follow along, just go and copy the URL. But you can pick this one or you can pick another one. Okay. So I'm first going to start by just creating a variable called URL and putting just pasting this inside of there. Next, I'm going to import uh, that newspaper library because I installed it. Maybe I should have done that first, but it doesn't matter. I uh, will say import newspaper. And even though it was we had installed newspaper 3K, we're doing import newspaper, the names are different. And that's just how they designed it. Okay. Now Here's how we get the article. Um, let's do an article equals newspaper dot article with a capital A, and then we pass in the URL. So what this is going to do is it's going to go and sort of create an article. We then have to add one more line, which is article dot download. So that'll actually download the article if you run that. You could, I could have, I probably should have done the URL and the, the other thing on the same line, but it doesn't matter. If you've done this, when you run article.html, you should see the HTML for the entire article, like the actual web page. It just went and downloaded it, essentially, into my phone. It's not, a, it's not necessarily on your computer anywhere, like in a file, but it's inside of Python for us to play around with. Yes. So the capital article is like a, it's a function? It's technically a class. When you have capital letters in Python, they're classes. But it's like, a, you can think of it as a function. A class is like a group of functions that are joined together. A class is like a thing. So, you know, um, a table is actually a kind of class. It's, it, when, you, when you reach different sizes of things, you have a bunch of functions, you start to think about how you group them together, and like a class is the next level up in right. terms of the grouping function. Um, but you don't really need to know what a class is to, to be able to use them. Uh, okay, so if you created this, you download it, now let's do some interesting things. Um, we have the HTML, but we have to do article.parse, and that 
we'll do some kind of cool magic. Um, if you've done article.parse, now I can get the article <coughs> title. I can get the article authors. And I can get the article text. And basically parse goes through all that HTML and pulls out these things for you. And it knows how to find the author, title, text. I think you can also grab the date of the article when the article is posted. Yeah. Any article? Yes. Yes. It's a really cool library. I was going to show you how to do it manually, and then I found out there's a library that doesn't create. Uh, the cool thing, so this text has like, it's hard to read. So this is a case actually where if you do print article text, it'll add like paragraphs and breaks and stuff like that. But in order for this to work, you have to parse the article first. If you, so if you don't parse, uh, you won't be able to grab this. For some reason, it needs to do this stuff. Yeah. Wait, so how does it pull the title? Like, is it just always the first line or something? Or? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if you want to see how many like get words, like let's say a word like players or blockchain. I'll show you the Okay. The next level here that is, comes with this library is natural language processing. Uh, in order to do that, we have to do article.nlp with parentheses. Another one of those sets that doesn't uh, allow. What is NLP? Uh, natural language processing. I know what we have to do. We're missing a step. Um, before we can do NLP, do this. Import NLTK. Uh, this is a very popular natural language processing library. And it looks like NLP requires this. And not only that, sorry. I wasn't anticipating this, but we have to do it. I just read through the error message really quickly. It basically says in the error message, look, look up error, resource pump not found. Please use the NLTK downloader to obtain the resource. And I'm about to do this. Import NLTK, NLT download pump. This is, um, so we do NLTK dot download, and then in here, P-U-N-K-T. Um, NLTK is, It'll, it'll download what's called tokenizers. NLTK is called Search for Natural Language Toolkit. It lets you do a lot of stuff in terms of parsing text. Um, for example, you can grab all of the words. You can grab just the named entities. You can do parse trees. It's basically, it is natural language processing in Python. And punct is one of the tokenizers, meaning it's one of the different formulas that have been created that will that you can use to break apart the words inside a text, but there's a few of these. So you do have to download this. Once you do this, then you can use the NLP function. And now what you can do is get the article.keywords. So it pulls out the keywords from the article. And what I think is cool is you can also get the article dot summary. Oh. You can print this. So it generates a summary of the article using natural language processing. You might ask how this works. I have no idea. I did kind of take a peek into the, I mean, when I saw this, I was like, that is cool. How is it doing that? And I took a peek. It goes through every sentence. It calculates a score for the sentence in terms of importance. Then it basically ranks the sentences by importance, and it just prints out the top five most important. <laughs> so it's like, not exactly magical, it's not creating new sentences, all of these are in the initial article, and there are ways of going a step further, but it's just pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate a, like a, PDF, a PDF of something, not necessarily a website, like a URL. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You you probably have to use some sort of Python <laughs> library for going through PDF, yeah. right? But uh, at the end of the day, so this this library was specifically for web articles, right? Because I had to get a URL and plug it in. Um, you could like the the NLTK library itself would just accept you know any text that you want to pass into it. So in this case, it's whatever text. So you could you have a library that would read the PDF. 
pass the text into that LTK, and then it would do this for you. Um, I'm going to leave it there, I think. I mean, the next step would be using the NLTK library to break apart the words and then count them in terms of frequency. Which I can show you the data. Yeah? Okay, we'll do that. Let me create another section just for the NLTK library. Um, it's relatively simple, it's like four lines and then the next shape. Uh, the first is we're going to do NLTK dot word underscore tokenize, and then we pass in the article text that we got before. What this does is it basically uses that tokenizer we downloaded to break apart the article into words. It's not as simple as just spaces, so there, you know, there's a little bit more that goes into it, but it's also not perfect, because you'll notice commas are interpreted as their own. Thing. So a lot of times you'll go through and you'll remove punctuation and stuff before you do this. But this is the first step. Uh, we will call this tokens so that we can use it for something else. But now that we have the different tokens, we can do NLTK dot frequency uh, distribution tokens dot most underscore common. And this basically counts up the words. Your period is the most popular word, so that's why you, you get rid of punctuation. <laughs> to the, to, of, and game. I guess game is you know, the highest there. Um, okay, and then the last thing I'll show you how to do is let's add a nice little matplotlib inline, because I'm going to show you a little graph. NLTK, same as we did before, that frequency, distribution, Tokens dot plot thirty cumulative equals false. Now we have a plot of the most frequent thirty words. Okay. One more. I'm, I'm, I'm collapsing the one above so we can see more. This is the whole. Three lines, and basically, you know, this and this part is the same. Um, what, so, what did you do to collapse that? Oh, if you just, uh, on the left side, if you just double click on any one of them, it'll collapse it. Now you can click and expand it. Right here, double click, and it does that. Uh, what is the difference between tokens and keyword? Uh, I invented tokens, I created a variable, so I can call this whatever yeah, I want. As in, uh, what is the difference between NLTK word underscore tokenize? And then when you're grabbing keywords, so how are the words? How is the output different? For, for keywords, yeah. Where do I do keywords? Oh, keywords was um, was part of the other a different library. I mean, this is just a list of words. But they're doing the same thing. No, keywords is getting uh, like text. This is not all the words in the article, right? Okay, that's. And this is a subset of the most important words in the article. So. Uh, it's basically tokenizing and then finding the most important, but not necessarily the most frequent because you see there's no like dots and stuff in there. Okay. So we have seven minutes, so I'm going to do a very quick wrap because we've covered a lot. So I, you're going to walk out of here thinking that was cool. What do I do? Trust me, I'll make this up available to you. <laughs> Welcome to the nerd zone. So like, we've done a lot. <laughs> Coded for the first time and then we sort of walked you into the wide world of data analysis and text analysis. And it's very common at this point to feel totally overwhelmed. That's fine. Part of the point. You learn more when you don't go slowly. Um, this was our path. So remember we did intro to Python, happy hour, basics of Python, data analysis, text analysis, Again, Python is huge, and you only need to know a little bit. Hopefully, what you are coming out. Uh, Albert Einstein said, never memorize anything you can look up. So don't forget that he didn't even know about Google. He didn't really proud. Just know that all, the whole dig, the, the world of Google, it's all at your fingers if you just know what Google is for. I do it all the time. But where do you go from here? Again, choose your own adventure, right? Any one of the things I showed you, you can dive deeper into. Uh, CBS has a few tech classes. Uh, the list is growing every year. 
and I don't even know what they all are. Um, so two, I teach intro to programming using Python and intro to databases for business analytics. But there's also a data analytics class in Python. There's a web app programming class. There is analytics in action, quantitative pricing and revenue analytics, digital literacy, and user experience and product management. And again, the list grows every semester. There's also three really good follow-up resources that I recommend for different reasons. So the first is called Learn Python the Hard Way. If you really are like, I want to know more about Python, like how does it work, the basics, all that stuff, this is a great resource. This is what I initially used to learn Python. It's got just like 50 exercises. You can do it in text form or watch videos. Then there's this book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, which is more of a focus on how do you do like little things in Python that are like, you know, opening Excel, sending emails, like doing short hacky scripts. And then the last is the Python Data Science Handbook, which is really more of a focus on like the Jupyter Notebook and uh, you know, CSV data and tables and whatever. So in a way, it's all built, but you can also go into any one of these. Right? You're not gonna, if you go right into here, you'll be fine if you skip the first stuff. So don't feel like you have to remember. Um, and that's really all I have to say about it. So we're out of here five minutes early. I'm quite proud of that. So I want to say thank you. And uh, you've all been great. Yeah.